We are all good. Sorry, please continue. What's happening? My neighbours are happening. Mrs. Downstairs is having a very, very enjoyable time. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Dead Ventures podcast. Uh, it's me. I'm Hayden, Falco Seventy Seven Stevens, uh, and I am joined by. Hello, I am Jordan Bowtie Cook. So Jordan and I do things on my Twitch channel, um, Twitch.tv forward slash Falco underscore Seven Seven, uh, and we we do a week a bit called Social Saturday, which takes place on Saturdays, funnily enough, uh, in the evening, and it's us. It's us and a couple of our friends, and we just spout shit for three hours and play whatever we feel, <laughs> and just play stuff that invariably will destroy our friendships. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, tends to be the way it goes. <laughs> so, this being the first one, Jordan, um, mm. I suppose we should in sort of give people a bit of a background on us kind of thing. Would you, would you like to start? Okay. Yeah, I'll start. Um, <clears throat> so, oh, God, it's, it's now immediately got to that point where it's like, Oh god, how do I talk about myself without sounding like such an arrogant douche? Hold on a minute, do you want me to sort of give you like some, some motivation here? Let me let me go biblical yeah, for you. Go In the beginning, there was Jordan. <laughs> and scene. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I was dead when I was born. Oh, charming, that's fun. I don't know. Let's, I mean, let's... hell, that's like, that's like my whole thing of... Yeah, hello, I'm Jordan, I'm a zombie, and people are like, what? And okay, <laughs> let's, uh, so before we get um, all the necrophiliacs Ow. and the um, zombie hunters after you, let's uh, fast forward a bit and let's talk gaming. <laughs> okay. um, or if there's anything right. else, or if you have any other major traits you want to talk about, about yourself. Oh, I'll, we'll, we'll cover the few little things. So, uh, being a gaming podcast then, I've been gaming since I was about six years old. Um, my f the first video game that I remember owning, like that was mine, was the original Crash Bandicoot on the PlayStation One. Nice. Um, good place to start. I don't remember completing it as a six-year-old because I think I was just like, "This is fun. I'm a weird orange cr creature." Despite the fact his name is Crash Bandicoot, I didn't know Bandicoots were a thing. <laughs> Nor did I um, actually. No, it's 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 just like, oh, it's just a funny name for a weird polygonal orange thing that goes whoa. Uh, <laughs> and then many years later would become meme of legend. Oh, I I I still think um the best one of those is uh oh what's it called bloody what's what's the gorilla song? Like one, one of my favorite gorilla Clint songs. Eastwood? No 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 um windmill windmill uh oh fuck feel good ink. Feel good ink, you're right, that's it, thank you. I had um, to run through part of the song, <clears throat> I had to run through, like, yeah. in my head, I just went, bam, 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 Yeah. Feel good. That was it. Um, yeah, that's my favourite Crash meme, is the, is the feel good ink thing. <laughs> um, but, but anyway, uh, the, the part of this podcast will be uh, scintillating science. I've been interested in science since I was about seven, actually. From really young, uh, when I was in my primary school, one of my uh, classmates' brothers gave in a bunch of uh, science books. They, they were aimed really for like 12-year-olds uh, and above, but I, I read them, and it was all about the human body, reproduction, um, virology, bacteriology, all that kind of stuff, and I was hooked immediately. Um, did it in A-level, did it at university, and now I'm in tech support. So, <laughs> shows, uh, shows, shows where that went. Um, yeah, apart from that, I've been friends with uh, Hayden for however many years. Christ, how long has it been now? It's been a while. When did we? So hold on, what year was it we met? Because I don't. Did oh. we not meet until I took over presidency of the Video Gaming Society? Yeah. Um, so that was 2014. I would think that was when it was then, because your first year of presidency was when I went to the Video Game Society, because that was my technical first year after my foundation. Oh crumb! So we've known each other five years now. Jesus Christ. <laughs> and I'm going to say that my uh, saddest gaming accomplishment currently is that I have 2,800 ongoing hours in Final Fantasy XIV. Yay! Do you know what? I don't think I've actually cracked the thousand year uh, barrier with any game. Have you not? Although, thinking about it, maybe I did with Lilac Wars? Okay. 
Because I would play... Lilac Wars on Mario 64, I must have done it with. Because I played both of those games religiously as a child. So, anyway, so, yes. So, Jordan, everybody, let's, let's hit, have some applause. Yay, Jordan. Yeah, okay. That, that's enough of that, yeah. Uh, right, so, let, let's sort of introduce myself to the people who don't know me. Hi, I'm Hayden. I am autistic. I have Asperger's Syndrome and ADHD. Um, I like playing video games. My earliest... My first ever memory is video games. That's going to be weird for people to wrap their heads around. So I was born in 1993. And... My first memory is I was in some kind of carry si one of that you know those children's like carry things that you carry a child around and then swing mm. at people if they get annoyed get annoyed. <laughs> um, I, I I remember being in one of those and somebody had had a Sega Saturn. I don't remember where this was, but someone had a Sega Saturn, and it wasn't until like earlier this year or last year that I finally identified the game from memory, and it was Knights. I remember somebody playing Knights on the Saturn. And ever since then, I think gaming has just been encoded in me from the start. Like, <laughs> that's it. I I grew up on the Nintendo 64 and the PlayStation 1. The original one, not the ra nice rounded off little PS1. The big, chunky square one. Yeah. Um, which we then had to confine to the bin when the uh, disc holder broke. Like, literally, just it all flew off one day and the disc tried to yeet itself out the inside of it. Oh, no. That was a sad day. Rest in peace. Rest in pepperoni, indeed. <laughs> The Nintendo 64 sort of formulated my years of gaming, really. I, and sort of like the games I played, I played five games on a rota, uh, religiously, despite the fact I was having more. And as I got older, I then started to play more of the others. But the core ones for me were Super Mario 64, Lilac Wars, or if any American li uh, listeners we have will better know it as Star Fox 64. There was then Revolt on the PlayStation 1, which was like an RC car racing game. And it had a track builder in it. And I, I would just build tracks. It was great. I'd, I'd make them really irritating tracks, though, that sort of crossed over all the time. Like, they weren't very good tracks, but I liked them. And then there was uh, and then Ace Combat 2 and 3, which sort of formulated when I was a kid because I wanted to be a fighter pilot as a child. And then I was then told I couldn't be a fighter pilot because I didn't have 20-20 vision when I was 11. So, fun times. I then made a similar pivot to you, Jordan, in that I really got heavily into science. I loved science. Up until I got to sixth form, when I realised how much I actually sucked at it. <laughs> so I, so from, I went from A student to U student. Ooh. And worked my way back up. Got into IT, went to uni the same university as Jordan did, started an IT degree, hated it with every fibre of my being in the first year, changed over to film, TV and radio. I'm now so I now work in television and... And then outside of that, I play video games, I stream on Twitch, and I just, I get too much into things. I've got a list of things that's just get, that I'm in denial that gets ever longer and longer and longer that <laughs> I want to play, read, watch, and I'm in <clears throat> denial that I'm never going to do it. But the first step is admitting that you have a problem, so this has been progress already. Yeah, but you've admitted you've had the problem since day one, Hayden. That's not, Shh. not progress. <laughs> <laughs> no tears, only dreams. <laughs> but yeah. Oh god. So yeah, I think that's a that's about us. So like, so what? Was, so you were saying earlier that your what was your first? Did you say your first game was again? Um, from that I can remember, I'm fairly certain my first game was Crash Bandicoot on the original PlayStation. Yeah. Um, again, not the nicely beveled circular thing, the big grey box, but. I don't know. I might have had something older. I just don't think... I just can't remember if that was the case. Yeah. The first games console I ever had, um, and I don't know if it's anywhere to hand at the moment, I'm not going to look for it, uh, was I was given a Game Boy Color for, I want to say, my fifth or sixth, maybe seventh birthday? How long did I have? Possibly my fifth birthday. It was the Atomic Purple one. And yeah. I've, I've had a love for Atomic Purple ever since. Um, and I think the first game I got was like a Bugs Bunny and Lola Bunny game. And I never beat this game, but it was quite fun. And then I just started building up the Game Boy collection. And then, yeah, it just kept going from there. And then uh, the first proper games console I bought, I was 11 years old. I had just had my birthday. I think I managed to get like 120 quid in total uh, in birthday money. And I went out and bought myself a GameCube. 
And nice. I still have that GameCube and the three original games I bought with it to this day. I mean, to be fair, I did um, sell one of them off at one point, but I rebought it, so I still have the original three games in my eye. Nice. Which were Sonic Heroes, Simpsons Hit and Run, and The Legend of Zelda Collector's Edition. Simpsons Hit and Run is so old now. If I ever get an upscaler, I'm gonna stream oh. it, because it's a damn good game. It's great. Dude, it's fun. an amazing game. Oh my god. Like, um, I'm, I'm just... Okay, in, in, so in that case, you, you see you've still got your GameCube. So yeah. what would be your favourite console to date then? N64. That shadow of a doubt, the Nintendo 64. That console made me. That console raised me. I mean, oh, if my parents are listening to this, obviously don't take a dig at that. <laughs> take that as a dig. It's just you know how much I played on that. You tried to stop me many, many a time. And it never worked. So that, that console <sighs> raised me. And... A lot of it sort of inspired the things I wanted to do, and it inspired a lot of my interests and all that kind of thing. Like I still like, although I can't, I've never got to be a fighter pilot. I still have a love of fighter jets and that kind of thing, and that comes from my love of gaming and all sorts. Um, I still have it. I've got Ace Combat Seven recently because I like fighter jets, and I really want to play it VR actually. So yeah, it's it's certainly fueled quite a lot for me, and it's given me a love as well for amazing stories like Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic um, okay so I'm not gonna spoil it for anyone just in case because I only completed Knights of the Old Republic for the first time in the last five years um, that has to be one of the best written games of all time and if you haven't played it buy it and when you get to the twist tweet us comment on the video whatever Without spoiling it, and tell us what your reaction to that twist was. And that's where I'm going to leave it. Because mm. holy shit, that was an incredible twist. It, it comes out of bloody nowhere. It does come out of nowhere. Like, it was completely unpredictable. And I'd, and... I'd, I'd played KOTOR 2 first. I played and finished KOTOR 2 first. Oh. So, this was many years ago, because I saw my dad playing it. I said, oh, can I play that? And he went, yeah, sure, you can borrow it before I sell it. And um, I played it through. And it was like, they were all talking about, like, Revan and Malak and everything. And then the conversations about Revan and Malak still popped up in KOTOR 1. I was just like, oh, okay, I get to learn a bit more about Revan and Malak. This is good. And I got really sucked into that mythos, uh, which mm. was really quite nice. And to this day, I think Revan still remains one of my favourite <clears throat> Star Wars characters. Yours and a lot of people. Like, there's actually, um, their story continues on, and you learn a lot more about them in the uh, Knights of the Old Republic. Sorry, just the uh, the Old Republic. The, ah. um the MMO. iOS MMO, yeah. Yeah. Um, which, again, is currently free to play. It's a bit dated. Um, I've been spoiled by Final Fantasy XIV, so I can't really play it anymore because it's just too clunky and old looking. But it's still a fantastic game with an unreasonably well written storyline. So I'd also recommend Nice Old Republic, Nice Old Republic 2, and then go and play the Old Republic MMO. It's actually very good. See, this is the thing. Like, I've never really <coughs> been able to get into MMOs. I no. never played WoW. I had Gu I've got Guild Wars 2. I actually bought Guild Wars 2 on release, actually. Oh, wow. Um, and I played it for a while, but I got bored of it because I was playing solo all the time. Mm. Um, but yeah, that was a thing. Uh, I've just never been one for, uh, for MMOs. Oh, fair. I think it's that, it's that kind of thing of it's, it's got to be the right audience, doesn't it? Um, and it's... It's an MMO. It's a massively multiplayer online game. You need to play with other people. Yeah. Um, and depending on the game, if you're playing with people that, like, say, because, you know, in, in most MMOs, you've got dungeons and things that are story related and you have to go in with other people based on your class. Um, like, for example, DPS, healer, sorry, tank, DP, tank, healer, and two DPS is what I was trying to say. Okay. Is the standard formula. <clears throat> and... Obviously, if you then go in as, like, a new tank, but everyone else is just doing that for, like, XP or whatever, and you're like, hi, I'm new, or I've not done this, like, tank this dungeon before, 50-50 chance that the people are either going to be, yep, no worries, take your time and give you advice, or just be like, get the hell out of here, why are you here, you suck. Yeah. And if you get that, if you get the latter first, that's it, game ruined. See, I was um, a solo player, that's the thing. I've, I've sort of... Like my so this sort of factors into where I talk about my autism a bit. Like I, like my social skills have only really come along since university. Like I have was never very good at interpreting how other people felt 
uh, and I don't think I particularly cared at the time. Um, but when I got to university, I started to sort of go through a period of reinvention, and I now sort of can I can follow along with people, kind of thing. But it's just like I I solo played because I just wanted to be on my own and just didn't want to socialise with people, which in an MMO is a pain in the neck. <laughs> Bit easier in, and I'm not trying to sell it to you. But I kind of am. Um, actually, a bit easier in Final Fantasy XIV. Because it's that kind of game where, okay, yes, do you have to do a lot of um, dungeons and trials and things with other people to progress the story. It's the only way to do it. But then, apart from those, you don't actually have to do anything else with people. Like, yeah, there are raids, which are 24 man. Yeah, there are extreme versions of the trials, which get you good gear. Yeah, 24 you know, man 20 raids? 24 man raids. Those are insane. Bloody Nora. In fact, I'll quickly go into one now. Um, Shadowbringers, which is the latest expansion, so 5.0. Right. Um, <clears throat> they have worked with the geniuses behind Near Automata. Near More Tomatoes? Yep. And the raid, the, the first part of the raid, <laughs> I knew it was coming. <laughs> the first part of the raid is called The Copied Factory. And... For those of you who haven't played Nier Automata before, I recommend going to do it, especially because a lot of what I'm about to say isn't going to make sense. But you run into a, um, a Type 2 android called 2P, the Papa. Um, yep, Papa I know. No. Papa, no! <laughs> Papa, don't preach. <laughs> and <laughs> and um, <clears throat> you find her with two other... Um, two of the race in there called Lalafell, who are very mischievous and like to dig for things and find uh, treasures and things. Those two in particular. And you go into there and find a bunch of the and uh, a bunch of the um, machines, like the machine life forms, kind of attacking her. And you help, you run in and help, and then you go through this entire massive area. But you've got near Automata's background music. You've got its enemies. You've got their attack patterns, but they're mixed in perfectly with Final Fantasy XIV's mechanics. And so you're fighting these um, and these machine life forms. You fight Engels in there. You fight some of the Goliath tanks. And I won't spoil the last boss, even though it's fucking everywhere. But the last boss is one of the androids that we come to know and love in Near Automata. And it's like that's only part one of three of this raid. And it's one of the most fun raids. Where you've got teams A, B, and C uh, with eight, sixteen, and then twenty-four people. And you've oh, it's it's, it's good. It's great. Okay, you're kind um, of selling me on this, actually. <laughs> so, to be fair, that is, that's endgame content. They're like, really endgame content. Yeah, but still, um, if you've got, <clears> like, for a game to sort of maintain quality as it goes mm. through, that's quite an impressive feat. And if you say you've got 2,800 hours in this game... Easy. Yeah. And you're coming up to this endgame content, and you love every second of it, and you're enjoying it, it. that mm. much... That's, that says massive things about, <clears throat> about the MMO and about how mm -hmm. well it's maintained and all of that stuff. Because there's a, lot of games, there's a lot of games out there that they start strong and end kind of weak. And mm -hmm. there's, even the, there's even the rarer case that starts strong, the middle fucking disappears, and the end is, <laughs> and the, you look at the end and go, what the actual fuck? Now, if anybody from uh, Capcom is listening to this, <laughs> I would really like you to revive Dark Void and actually finish the damn game! I wholeheartedly agree. That thing started out so strong and had such a good premise, and then it was just like... And then... Wait. A pa so apparent, apparently, it fell foul of the writer's strike. There was a writer's strike oh. at some point. Like If you know shows like Heroes, like Heroes had a bit where the missile di middle disappeared from it because there was a writer's strike on. And... On it, so, right, let's actually give some background here. Dark Void. Um, Dark Void is a, was a, like a third person adventure game, sort of around the time when fucking Nolan North was everywhere. Um, <laughs> like, you'd go from Assassin's Creed 1 to Dark Void to, I want to say, Uncharted, and you wouldn't change voice actor. Uh, <laughs> like, Nolan North was just everywhere. Like, he even has his own special voice in one of the Saints Row games. It's literally just called Nolan North that you can set for your character. Um, we, we did this. Um, I played this game, and it starts off as, like, a generic third-person shooter. But partway through, you get given a, a, a flight suit or a jetpack that allows you to transition seamlessly 
from running around third person shooting to third person flight mechanic uh dog fighting mechanics similar to what you'd find in like an ace combat game that and you could switch between these any time you want literally no loading screen it would just be like right i'm a i'm a double jump to take off and fly and you could then go back down touch down and just start taking things apart so what this would effectively mean is you could surgically insert yourself anywhere on the map to pick your enemies apart or you could do strafe runs with the guns or you could just drop yourself in and advance as normal and mm. it starts out so well and then the whole middle of the game is missing because of said writer's strike and then it jumps to the end and it's it's such a shame because from the beginning and the end you can tell that the middle would have been absolutely phenomenal and I would absolutely love to see that game in a finished state because that mechanic was just perfect. And even if they just, it, even if they just did the same game again, put the middle in and just upped the graphics and gave it that kind of a remaster, it would be perfect. And I would love it with every heart, um, with every fibre of my being. Even in that state, in the state I got it in, though, still worth the two quid I paid for it. <laughs> <laughs> like seriously, most bargain bin games don't deserve the money you pay for them. This one did. Oh, dear. And I will fight that point with anyone. I mean, yeah, well, you pay two quid for it. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> it was either two oh. or three quid, which I think, factoring today's economy, is about £5,000. <laughs> <laughs> That's enough about us and sort of our gaming history a bit. Let's actually get into the meat and potatoes of what we wanted to discuss, which has sort of yeah. spawned this. So... We so what we te so what we do is we go diving through the general nerd sphere, and we find sort of like the standout things that are sort of big in at time of recording, and we sit down and we have a chat about them. So let's talk about the big one, which is Pokemon Sword and Shield. And Jordan, you've got a lot to say yeah. on this, so I'm gonna let you take point here. Oh wait, what? Okay. Um, <laughs> all right. So yeah, Pokemon Sword and Shield. Um, when that was first announced. Harvey and I especially were very excited for this game because the the first thing that sold us was it's it's a Pokemon game, like a mainline Pokemon game that isn't Let's Go on the Nintendo Switch. Which means you can play it on your big screen TV, like your normal TV. It's the first mainline Pokemon game on your television from the get-go. That was the first selling point for me. That's amazing. It's Pokemon, right? It's always been handheld. And we then started to learn more about, you know, the starters, which are one of the best starters so far, in my opinion. I absolutely love them. I'll agree with that, especially as we sort of stagnated for a while with <clears> all the types <throat> that would be... Like, you were guaranteed to get a firefighting type by the end of it. Oh. Like, that got, that got old real quick. I'm glad they made an effort to change. And, like, I think since mm. Gen 2, these starters have been pure from the off, so they are just fire, grass, water the whole way up the chain. Yeah, um... And I say I, I actually I love the fact that all these three are just their base starters. They're, they're their base types: fire, water, and grass. I love that. That's great. They don't need to be anything else. Um, also, Cinderace is the best. Fight me. And mate, me and my Inteleon have got w uh, words to have with you. <laughs> I'm sure they do. As does my Cinderace's energy ball. Um... <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who uh... are listening to this, I just flipped Jordan off. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Pretty soon after that, um, when they released more and more information, then started coming the, the negative press that we all know and love of Yay. the biggest one being Dexit. Um, portmanteau of, you know, Pokedex and Brexit. Um, <clears throat> then they don't have every single Pokemon in this game um, for you to catch and, I'm, you know, log and all that. Which, okay, I've had... Pokemon since the first one, since Red and Blue. Uh, I had a uh, Pokemon Blue on a neon green Game Boy Color uh, back when I was seven years old. And that's it. Pokemon fans, <laughs> Hayden just fist bumped me. Um, and so for me, personally, that doesn't bother me because we now have nearly 900 of the sodding things. And I have a life. Um, that came out wrong. But... <laughs> <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, I have other video In games come to the play. negative <laughs> comments already. 
oh, you can throw him in, call me whatever you want. I literally don't care right now. I'm too sick. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, like I've I've got other things to do. I've got other games to play. I've got work. Like I'm not in my house eleven hours a day. Um, you know, I'm a fully functioning adult now, and. Yeah, I get it that so many people want to have their Pokemon from other games that weren't in this one. You know, they've had since Pokemon Red and Blue or Sold and, uh, Gold and Silver brought up through the generations and they can't have them anymore. I get that. That is sad because I had the same thing and had to get rid of them all with Pokemon Bank when I sold my DS. But at the same time, you don't really need every Pokemon anymore, in my opinion. And they've got 400 of them and they're a good variety. They're also really well animated. And that was one of the biggest gripes, was the animations were reused or bad. And it's like, the anime, okay, yeah, some of the animations were, were definitely reused. I noticed that. But most of them are new. And the vast majority of them were upscaled and uh, you know, given next-gen tweaks and all that. And so that argument actually disappeared fairly, fairly soon after the game came out, I found. That one... Like people were picking that apart, like animation, 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 and as soon as the game came out, those stopped. Very strangely. Yeah. Um, the one that continued was Dexit. That's the only one people have seemed to be griped about in the past month or so. Yeah. So I'm I'm sort of going to wade in here. So I've started Poke my Pokemon adventure with Gen Three. I I ordered Ruby and Sapphire online, and I ended up with bootleg copies. Uh, Oof. I did not know this for many years. Um, I've since passed them on to my nephew and I actually bought legitimate ones but um, Ruby and Sapphire was where I was started and I would buy virtually every Pokemon game that came out and I would play them through uh, I'd even buy like I before I got with my girlfriend I would buy like both ones from a thing so I would buy Ruby and Sapphire so I could play through with different starters and just do that I couldn't do anything I just enjoyed the games that much um However, once we got to past uh, Pokemon Y, that's where my love for Pokemon started to wane. And I think as well, it was my love for, for handheld gaming started to wane as well, because I got massively into PC gaming. And mm. I, I, got, I can remember exactly where I stopped in <clears throat> Pokemon Omega Ruby, which was, I went through the lava, I'm in the cave with Groudon, just about to challenge him, and I've stopped. Because I've got no desire to carry on. Which is sad. And I thought, hey, maybe it's a blip. Maybe it's because it was like in my last year of university and I was a bit stressed at the time. I'm going to get Pokemon Moon. Got Pokemon Moon. I haven't even encountered the legendary Pokemon. I haven't even beaten the league. I, Again, I just stopped. I don't know why. I just did. I just stopped playing the game. And that's what caused me to sort of skip Pokemon Let's Go, and in the end I'm quite grateful for skipping Pokemon Let's Go, because it just seems more like... Okay, so we know Pokemon isn't, like... It's it's relatively easily accessible. Pokemon Let's Go legitimately feels like it should just have my first Pokemon game slapped on the front of it. It's <laughs> it's sort of like... It's so simple a preschooler can play it. Mm. Um... So I skipped that, and then Sword and Shield came out, and Sword and Shield got me excited, because I am a massive fan of the Colosseum games. So, for those of you who don't remember the GameCube era, Jesus fucking Christ, that's weird to say, <laughs> there were two Pokemon games for the Nintendo GameCube. They were Pokemon Colosseum and Pokemon XD Gale of Darkness. And you may think, they've done Pokemon games on console before. Yes, but these were very different, because they gave you an a bit, because they introduced a new type of Pokemon, which new Pokemon uh, Go players will have just encountered, called Shadow Pokemon. Mm. And the other mechanic it in introduced was, you could steal Pokemon. You yeah. could steal Pokemon from other trainers. However, that capture lim ability was limited only to Shadow Pokemon. And in, uh, in Colosseum, there were no wild Pokemon. So you could only capture the 48 Shadow Pokemon. And mm. this was basically Gen 3 era, so it took you up to that point. And then in Gale of Darkness, they did introduce wild Pokemon, which you could capture, but again, it was a very limited amount, and you had to have bait certain traps. Now, when I looked at Sword and Shield initially, Colosseum and Gale of Darkness popped into my head with one very significant difference. The distinct lack of edge that Colosseum and XD Gale of Darkness had. Because <laughs> Jesus Christ, you look at your character for XD... Like, in, in Pokemon Colosseum, like, you were, like, proper white hair, great coat. You've got a <laughs> fucking hover, mo uh, hover motor unicycle. 
it's ridiculous. And your starters are Umbreon and Espeon, which I have somewhere floating in the ether, and I need to recover them somehow. Yeah, we can we can we can work on doing that. Yeah, I need to. I want to bring them up to Sword and Shield. Nice. And then the wild area got unveiled, where you could actually wander around. And it looked very Breath of the Wild, and I thought this is good. They're bringing over more stuff from some of the other Nintendo games. Then Dexit got announced, and I was a bit like, hmm. <laughs> okay, I'm a reserve judgment until I play the game. Hmm. That's when I stopped. I sort of disengaged from as much of the Pokemon news as possible. I still caught wind of the animations and caught wind of some of the other stuff. Then I I actually took time off work to play Pokemon on stream on release day. And some of the videos are floating around on the YouTube channel. All of my reactions sort of going in were blind. I literally knew nothing about the map or anything or even about most of the Pokemon. Like, bar the starters, I didn't know anything about most of the Pokemon. Started playing the game. Loved it. Uh, the first thing that did catch me was I did spot some of the animations, which was Charizard has had the same animation since Pokemon Stadium. Mm. And I noticed that, but the model looked good, so I was like, that's fine, not a big deal. Like, I noticed it, it's like, oh, that's a thing, and then completely forgot about it. I have noticed that some of the moves sort of aren't as... Like, you know, you know which of the moves are the newer ones, because they've got better animations. Mm. Um, and some of the old ones sort of like double kick especially it's just the character just sort of hops up psh, hops up psh, and that that's fine I can live with that I mean mm. the best thing they could have done was to reduce their workload because this is such a huge game the best thing they could have done was cut down their workload and they did that with Dexit and they did that with some of the animations what they've done is they've set the groundwork to then make improvements with later games and that's how I'm sort of taking it and if my prophecy does come correct when the next Pokemon game comes out uh, whatever it may be, then yeah, that's fine. But one question I also want to pitch to you, Jordan, is you say there's about mm. 900 of the sods suck now. Yeah. Don't you think they should stop? <laughs> well, that's the thing. Um, I don't know if they ever will at this point, because... Let's, let's... This is the thing, let's be real. There was a time, like, black and white, you could kind of tell they were starting to run out of ideas. There are some absolute gems in black and white, don't get me wrong. Mm. Definitely. And, like, the Ultra Beasts thing in uh, Sun and Moon was a really nice touch. I really wish I'd learned mm. more about it and actually played the fucking game to the end now. <laughs> but the point I'm getting at is I enjoyed Sword and Shield so much. What day is it? It's Monday now. On Sunday, uh, yeah, so yesterday, I actually finished Pokemon Sword completely. Post-game content and all. I've unlocked the Battle That's... Tower now. I really enjoyed it. It was a really nice experience. It was super fun. It was challenging. I'm still fucking salty that I dropped a single match, which was against the champion. Otherwise, I would have had a clean sheet all the way through to the le to the end of the game. And I am mad about that. <laughs> but as well, some of the starters were all very well designed. Very, very charming. There were some beautiful animated cutscenes. Like when the so like when the starters are first revealed in game, that little cutscene of them running around is just it's so adorable. It's so, so cute, and it really sort of sets the spirit of the game, and that's where I worked it. And they nailed UK culture, like train delays, perfect! Um, oh no, they were constant. It was fantastic! <laughs> I really felt like I was in the UK, says he, sitting uh, in the UK. And yeah, you get all oh, sorts of stuff like that, and some of the Pokemon actually felt a lot more original, just because... Hmm. I don't know what it is about the UK, but I think it's because we complain about everything so much, people sort of know a lot more about the UK than they need to. So, like, we complain about sheep, we complain about everything. Yep. Yeah, it's fine. So, I, I think a lot of the negative press was massively overblown. Yes, Dexit was a shame, because I couldn't get my favourite bird Pokemon, which was Staraptor. But mm. Braviary was still there, and I got a new favourite in Corviknight, or Brookady, which was, I think, the first or second Pokemon I caught. I picked a water starter for the first time, and absolutely loved it, and really appreciated sort of how each Pokemon evolved in its own way. There were some new type matchup, uh, type combinations, which are quite nice. So like uh, mm. Toxel being a poison electric type, super weak to ground types, but it's a really interesting and flexible type, which is cool to use. I also developed a new favorite in Phantom because ghost grass type, <laughs> and then discovering I couldn't evolve because I had to trade it. I was just, and then making a deal with the viewers to be like, fuck it, let's beat the league with a Phantom. And I did. Phantom did the Lord's work. There's no two ways about it. <laughs> it's one of those things where Pokemon Company took a gamble because this was a big undertaking and people didn't like the gamble they were taking because they wanted it all to be the same. But on delivery, it was good. 
Uh, mm. I will. I will actually back the Pokemon company in that they made the right decisions in this to make a Pokemon game that was of a decent quality, that was enjoyable, that actually felt different as well because the whole flow of the story and everything felt massively different. Mm. Uh, I actually completely agree with you there. Like again, Dexit was a it was a bit upsetting. I'll admit. I was like, oh, okay. Well, I'm going to miss out on some of the Pokemon I know and love as well. But you're right. Everything else they added in was marvelous. Like the way you get berries now from trees. Like you just shake them, and you get a random bunch of berries. The camping system, which is the new Pokemon and me, like to raise affection. I love yeah. the camping system. <laughs> just your face when I said camping, and you're like, oh, you're like your your eyes lit. <laughs> so the main reason I love the whole camping si scenario is purely because you can make curry in that game, and oh, the so curry the curry making system is literally one of the most fun things I know in that game. Like, second to the game itself, that whole curry-making scheme is just, mwah, perfect. Um, in fact, I'm going to quote Spiffing Brit here and go, mwah, perfectly balanced, Todd Howard, perfectly balanced. <laughs> but yeah, it's fun. it was good. It was really, really good. I thoroughly oh, enjoyed actually... it. And the fact that you, when you went camping, all of your Pokemon were out of their Pokeballs, wandering around and all of that, was just, it was great. Mm. I think that's, that's one of the biggest kind of things that annoyed me as well, is people complained about the curry decks. That was one of the biggest criticisms that came out as well, was people were like, oh my god, how can they... Yeah, they were like, how can they have a curry dex when they've taken out this many Pokemon? It's like, well, one, it's like, you've got maybe ten types of actual curry, and then you just kind of tweak them a little bit with different berries, and that just kind of... You, you just add them to a little tick list, basically. My thing of that is, okay, so what about Pokeblocks? And, and Ruby and Sapphire? And Puffins, and the other one, which I can't remember. Yeah, I can't remember any of the others either. I just remember Puffins, Pokeblocks. I loved mm. doing the Pokeblocks thing. That was great. Pokeblocks was amazing, especially when you had um, when you had a full thing of four people and you could just hit it perfectly. I never got four... to experience that. Yeah, you could get four-way link cables. And... No, I know, but I never got to experience it. Oh, that's such a shame. Like, uh, one of my friends back in secondary school before I moved to Kent uh, was like, hey, we've got Pokemon uh, Ruby and Sapphire. Do you have that as well? I'm like, yeah. Like, oh, we're doing a bunch of Pokeblocks on this day. Do you want to join in? I was like, hell yeah, I want to join in. And we made something stupid like 100 odd Pokeblocks. Nice. And they were, they were all perfect quality because we just kept <laughs> we I just kept nailing it. So I actually attribute uh, <clears throat> Pokeblocks to my sense of timing because I can, now, I can nail timing by observation now. So yeah. like I was so I was playing a game called My Time at Portia and there's a shoot mm. a little shooting game in it and um, it's just balloons that move across but some of them wiggle back and forth and everything. I rapidly worked out that they all got a sync to a specific to no matter how fast they move, they sync to a certain pattern. And if you find the right point, you don't ever have to move your gun, you just shoot. And I've just been, and I just started maxing the accuracy, so fun times. Um that's a tangent. Uh, back to sort of that. Yeah, I, I find the whole complaining about curry thing like legitimately dumb. It was a re it's mm. a really fun mechanic, and I love it. Yeah, and it's exactly the same with poker blocks. You get some people in, it makes it uh, faster and generally uh, higher quality. You make better curry. Your Pokemon are happier. You're happier. Done. And <laughs> it's exactly the same with poker blocks. Curry Dex is. I love it. I, I actually I love the whole uh, concept of the curry decks. I've actually been trying to build that up um, and use different combinations of berries, but some of them are so hard to find. Yeah, and the main thing is that, that shaking the trees is always a gamble, because the first one, you're guaranteed to get berries. That's fine. And nine times out of ten, the second shake is safe. Mm. And then there's the mythical third, and you've had like two <laughs> berries drop out, the trees still shake, and you're just like, these are some rare berries on the ground, but I could get more. <laughs> I oh, think so I said. Um... No, so go on. I, I, I was about to say. I think I've had one occasion where I've been able to shake the tree for the third time safely. Oh, you must have been really unlucky then, because like, um, I was just about to say, you mentioned how you've been getting good with patterns. It's the same with shaking the tree for berries. Um, when it shakes, when it's like, like there's no break between the leaves shaking. That's when you stop. Everything oh. before that is yeah. Every, everything before that is safe. Oh. But like yeah. So it's, it, it could be a case of like, all right, I'm gonna shake it and it shakes once and then it just waits. No, I'm good. Shake it again. It does that. Shake it again. It still does that. Shake it again. Oh, okay, I missed that. Fifth time, and then you shake it one more time and then it's like, 
rigorous shaking, no breaks between, then it's like, okay, then I'm going to stop. But you could get like 20 berries doing it. Bloody Nora. Um, mm. Yeah, mind you, I've also not <clears throat> dropped a single Dynamax capture yet, so... And I have, so uh, to everyone at home, I've just flipped Hayden off. Hey! <laughs> 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 dear, oh, dear. dear. So yeah, I, I think that's enough about Pokemon, so... Yeah, let's, let's, let's move on. We've sort of covered like the whole state of it. Um, but yeah, let's, let's move on to something that you're, that you're sort of uh, so we're talking about the um, the new Xbox X series, which yes. isn't going to be confusing to parents who don't game at all. <laughs> it's actually going to be even more confusing uh, because even though so they introduced it as the Xbox X series, that's going to be the new line. So similar to how they've got you know Xbox One, Xbox One S and Xbox One X, they'll be doing something similar with this new generation of the X series. So what you're saying is that, quite feasibly, we could see Xbox One XXX. Well, I'm not saying that. <laughs> <laughs> but yes. At some point uh, it could happen, and it's going to be hysterical <laughs> when it does. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they're, they're moving away from Xbox One. It's just, <laughs> But what's making this even more confusing is that uh, they've actually come back. I can't remember. I think it's actually Phil Spencer who said this himself. Don't quote me on this, because I'm not entirely sure. I don't have it in front of me at the moment. But um, they're changing the name of these ones again. This next one that's coming out that kind of looks like a mini fridge, which I love, by the yeah. way, uh, is just going to be called the Xbox. Now, if we think back to 2006, or maybe even a bit before, when the Xbox. Some of you, some of you may remember that there was already a big, chunky console with a giant X on it called the Xbox. <laughs> which had the biggest, fattest, unusable controller if you were a child that ever existed. Ah, uh, the Duke. Duke. And it's actually a marvellous controller. <laughs> yeah, this like... is the thing. Microsoft always sort of nailed their controllers weirdly. Like, um, mm. I'm, I find... I mean, I still use an Xbox 360 controller for when I'm gaming. But the Xbox mm. One controller is quite nice because I've used them at work. I do quite like the PS4 controller, but I've noticed like when I'm playing games like Days Gone that use the touchpad, you can just easily sort of like gently look, fingertip the um, the touchpad, and it'll be like, and here's your menus. And I'm just yeah. like, please no. <clears throat> so that's, that's that's kind of my one drawback with it. I've I've, I've used I, I have an Xbox One S, um, and that's not to say that I'm like Xbox fanboy because I'm not. I started my gaming career as I mentioned earlier with a PlayStation. And I had a PlayStation 2, had Xbox, and then had Xbox 360 and kind of just fell off the PlayStation bandwagon from there. But I've used both controllers. I prefer the Xbox One. It's, mer it's more ergonomic personally. Because the way you've got the, way the right stick is on the bottom, next to the, like right next to the, uh, the face button, you know, A, X, Y, B. And how you've got the left stick on the top left, with the uh, D-pad on the bottom left where that be switched for the PlayStation controller. I actually prefer. I feel it's easier on my hands, as well as having triggers, like it's got left and right trigger as opposed to L two and R two, which I think are a bit harder for me to not hit, but like puts less strain on me. If that makes sense. Yeah, because the, the triggers on the Xbox controllers <coughs> are longer, so they actually feel a bit more like triggers. Where L two mm. and R two have evolved into these buttons that have a little bit of hang down, so they feel like triggers. Yeah. Which, don't get me wrong, it's fine, and people prefer it, and I, 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 I can see arguments for both sides. I just prefer Xbox for that kind of... Yeah, I mean, I prefer Xbox for my PC gaming, but that's, that's mm. the thing. Uh, that's actually a point, actually. So this is some news that came out recently, if, while we're still on the subject of controllers. So have you, have you seen that PlayStation have announced a uh, back button uh, attachment for the, PS4, for the DS4? Yes, I have. Um, which I, I really like, because it's kind of like, oh, they've, they've seen what uh, Microsoft has done with the Xbox Elite series of controllers, where they've got the back paddles, um, and you can also, I mean, to be fair, with the Elite series, they've also increased the ergonomics, added, like, rubber uh, grips, and, and they've added it to the... Out. Yeah, well, exactly, that's with the, um, the they've got four, four paddles on the back where you would normally hold the controller with, like, your two middle fingers, um, and you've also got uh, switches on the triggers that change them between half triggers and full triggers. Um, which is quite nice for like that kind of Twitch gaming. But yeah, they've they've added it so you can clip it into the bottom of your PlayStation uh, 4 controller, 
It's got a little OLED screen, which kind of lets you click between 16 different button combinations. And then, yeah, you've got two little back buttons, which, again, you can click with your middle fingers. I think it's a really nice idea for, like, £30. Yeah, 30 quid. that's a really nice price point, I find. But the, here's the thing that... Here's one of the things that concerns me, that I had a thought about it. One, what is that going to do to the DualShock battery life? Hmm. And the other thing is... So, obviously, we know the PS5 is on the horizon. But coming in, the monolith that it is. Uh, the pizza <laughs> heater, as I think I've seen a picture of it. <laughs> now... I'm thinking, could this be a test bed for a DS5 Pro controller? Mm. Because if this takes off and people like it, then when the DualShock 5 gets announced, then there, obviously there'll be a bog standard DS5, and then you'll have your DS5 Pro controller, which will have the built-in back buttons, and um, like paddles and everything. Which mm. um, So it's quite interesting that... PlayStation decides to do this. And the timing is also very interesting, because I don't know if anybody has been keeping up with the news. Uh, this is going to be old news by the time this goes out, but uh, Scuff Gaming was recently bought by Corsair. So, so Scuff is now part of the Corsair family. Now, I'm looking at Corsair now, because they've made a couple of interesting purchases in the past couple of years. One of them being Elgato. Oh, really? So, Elgato and Scuff Gaming are now under the Corsair umbrella. Now, Corsair, I... I'm not going to make a secret of this. I love Corsair. I like most of the time when I'm building a PC, when it comes to like RAM, power supplies, Cors and even cases, Corsair's the first place I go just because I know their stuff is reliable and it hasn't failed me yet. And I emphasize the yet. So for Elgato and Scuff to be under the Corsair umbrella, to me speaks volumes about product quality. And it also to me shows that maybe Corsair is starting to make a push sort of into the gaming production and esports realm kind of thing. Because now that they sort of manufacture what are some of the standards for game capture hardware, and now they're also dealing with controllers that are most likely used by pro esports players, it does sort of it gives me an idea that they might sort of be moving it more taking esports a lot more seriously in that regard. Fair enough. It's one of those honestly, it's one of those things that obviously you you, know, you work in T V, um you're more tune with those kinds of things sports is one of those things i never look at very much kind of moving away from what we were talking about just very briefly yeah you wanted to get into kind of esports and that kind of sphere what would you think would be one of the best places to start off like for a complete novice like myself who's never gone into esports uh okay that's quite an interesting that's actually quite an interesting question okay um so from my experience it's find a game that you like find an esport that you like um, so for a lot of people, like most people's like first introduction to an esport is they find a free game that they enjoy. I'm looking at League of Legends and Dota 2 here, because uh, they're free games. People play them. They then get into the mechanics and everything, and off the back of that, they then become interested, get better at the game, and then become interested in the pro circuits. But you've also got games like I think more. I think so. I sort of over the years, when it comes to esports, been thinking like in terms of how esports grows and develops, you sort of need to play your audiences, and you also need to, if you want to entice new viewers in, you've got to stick to a bit what's familiar. Now, a lot of people think, oh, so that will mean like your FIFA and your CODs, and I'm just like, actually no, because FIFA has a FIFA esports has got quite a weird format, I find. So, like for FIFA, when they run tournaments, they have both Xbox and PlayStation. So there, and then. For the finals, you play on both platforms and you flip it over, which I think is a bit of a waste. It doesn't that doesn't quite make sense to me. Um, where because like you get a lot of fighting games that are primarily all played on PS4, but you then have people who, um, but then in the FGC they bring in their own controllers and things. The game I would actually say that should be the point like of the of the esports sphere for sort of ushering it in properly into the mainstream is actually Rocket League. Okay. Rocket League is the game. Rocket League and CS:GO are the two games I think that should be the point of the spear for esports going into the mainstream. Rocket League, purely because it's football, it's car football, it's easily recognisable but different enough to be interesting. And I have had the I've had the chance to work with a couple of Rocket League guys who are big, who are well known in the community. Their names are um, uh, Cool Cole and Stumpy Goblin, and they they run a they run a channel a Twitch channel called Subpar but in HD. And they are two of the nicest people I've ever met. They're brilliant, and they just get involved. In fact, the 
Rocket League Championship Series was hosted in Madrid a couple of days ago. And what tends to happen is they and their viewer base, they all pile in. Uh, they all pick an area of the stadium to go sit and they'll do chants, they'll do a lot. It's like a football event, basically. A lot of what they say can be taken on board and actually influence the event. Rocket League itself is it's a driving football game. So you've got the similar mechanics of driving. It's actually got a lot of depth to it that is just getting the pure mechanical skill down. There's no sort of... Like, what items do I buy to counter this particular hero or this particular scenario I'm in? It's just getting mechanics down. It's just getting that muscle memory down. And that's good because it's it's just an easy game to watch. You can just watch Rocket League and you can immediately know what's going on. It's just like, okay, orange team's got two goals, blue team's got three goals, and there's 25 seconds left on the clock. This is, it's quite interesting. And seeing those players pull off those mechanics in midair, that kind of thing, it's also got that... It's got that wow factor to it. It's got that layer of impressiveness that sort of sh highlights how... Um, that sort of highlights the... Um, oh, what's the word? Sort of highlights how showy and flashy that game can be. You've then also got... And, and then, as I mentioned earlier, CSGO. Um, CSGO, people sort of... People think, well, why would you go for CSGO over Call of Duty? CSGO is quite different from most shooters. CSGO revolves around a single, uh, competitively revolves around a single game mode called Defusal, which is where you have a bomb. If you're if you're playing the terrorist or T side, you have to plant the bomb and get it to go off or wipe out all the counter terrorists or CTs. CT's job is to either kill all the terrorists before they put the bomb down or defuse the bomb. Basically, it. So even if all the terrorists are dead, they can still win if the bomb goes off. Now, with that, there are some. It's again, it's a lot easier to follow because it's quite variable in pace. Whereas Call of Duty is quite twitch focused, frantic, and all go. CSGO, to begin with, affords a bit of slowdown. So people will fan out, explore, they'll get their positions, and then engagements will start, and it's dead easy to follow. You can watch stuff, you kind of get an idea for it in that respect. It's quite, once you watch a few games, you sort of understand why people do things. And you also can factor in the whole... Uh, there's an there's an in-game economy where you earn money, and you, that money contributes to what kind of guns you can buy at the beginning of each map, at the beginning of each round. And it's quite interesting in that respect because how well you perform depends on how well your arsenal, how good your arsenal is. And off the back of that, even if you're going to lose, running away with a gun in hand can change the tide because you carry that gun over onto the next round and that can change the entire tide of a battle. So say, for example, your sniper dies, you can pick up his sniper rifle, run, the round ends, start the next round, you throw his sniper rifle to him, you've just saved money there. Which means you can carry that money over into the next round to then further give yourself more of a fighting chance. I So I didn't start watching CSGO until a couple of years ago. And... I got treated... It was an E-League, I think it was. The final I watched was absolutely phenomenal. Because there was... Because um, it was two teams. One of them was FaZe Clan, who a lot of people have heard from a bunch of different games. And then there was another uh, lesser-known team at the time, who are now quite well-known, called Astralis. If you've ever heard of Astralis, you will know that these guys are multi-world champions and have only recently had their first defeat in, I think, 14 different tournaments. But that might be old information. So do your own research, is what I'm saying. In that match, so the way CSGO works is you have... It's out of 30 rounds, and whoever gets more rounds... Um, so it's first to 16, basically. And there's potential for ties and that kind of thing. I watched I watched FaZe. It was very even until the overtime. And there was an overtime at one point. And then FaZe went, I think it was 12 matches up. And Astralis were about 6, I think it was, maybe? So, obviously, you think, oh, FaZe are going to win this. Astralis pulled it back, got, and it then drew up, and it then went to overtime again, and then Astralis won. And it was phenomenal to watching. I got swept up with it. I was actually shouting at the TV screen. <laughs> it's, again, it's a fantastic spectator sport, which doesn't require a lot of in-game knowledge to be able to sit down, watch, and appreciate. So Fantastic. Yeah, so, where, so yeah, with, I think... Going back to the sort of Corsair bit, if Corsair then starts supplying PCs, capture software, controllers, 
they sort of cornered the esports side of things, and then it just means they can sponsor events, and then companies will just sort of be like, yeah, we'll feature you, please help us with the broadcast kind of thing, and that sort of thing, and that's how it all sorts of meshes together kind of thing. It might do that, they might not. I am have no business knowledge whatsoever, I just call it as I see it, and nine times out of ten, I'm wrong. <laughs> but at least you call it. I, at least I call it. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Um, I think with that tangent there, Yes. Uh, back on to, as you mentioned, uh, Corsair controllers, going back to our original topic of conversation, uh, which was the Xbox Series X. Yes. Now, <laughs> have, you seen, have you seen this thing? I've seen the memes. It's beautiful. Like, what? I mean, the first <laughs> thing I thought when I looked at it, I went, they've just built a small PC. <laughs> yeah. It's basically what like, I thought when I looked at it. Yeah, like, that's the thing. Um, based on, again, what I've initially seen and initially read, and this might have changed, this might still change, because it's going to be released holiday 2020. So it, we've got full year until release. It's essentially got the same graphical and processing capacity as my current computer, which is a solid 8 gig of uh, DDR3 RAM. It's a good 3.1 uh, gigahertz quad four processor. I think they're actually uh, making that stronger, I believe, for the X uh, for the Xbox as it's going to be called. My graph, my video capacity is uh, a 1060 Ti at four gigabytes, like that that kind of stuff. And essentially, that and more is going to be what's going into this new Xbox, which is just a mini tower because it's going to be upright, as opposed to all the other Xboxes which have been on their side. And it is a mini fridge. And I love it, and I want it so bad. <laughs> See, now this is the thing. Like, I, would you say it's now arguable to say, like, pretty much since I think it's fair to say actually since like the 360 upwards, consoles have sort of been slowly making this shift away from sort of games console to pre-built PC. Um, I think it's definitely fair because that's one of the biggest things they they keep mentioning with every new release of generation of console the, like the, the spearhead they always go into how much more powerful it is than their predecessor they go into how much uh, ram and graphics and processing capability it has compared to say a standard gaming pc like like mine um they always make these comparisons and they always do it in terms of home entertainment system which is again what a pc technically is even if you've geared your pc for gaming Watch YouTube on it, you can watch streams on it, you can stream on it, you can do uh, video editing and all this kind of nonsense with your PC. It's not just for that one purpose. No, but and that's what I, they're trying to do. Yeah. Yeah. But my, my sort of counterpoint there, but then isn't it all sort of like uh, the intent with which it's made? So, say for example, I've, mm. I originally spec'd my PC primarily as a high end gaming machine. Mm. The fact that I can do other stuff on it is a bonus. So, for me, this is yes. primarily a gaming machine, but it does the other thing. So, it's a gaming system first and a multimedia system second. Whereas, I think mm. one of the things that threw people off the Xbox One a lot was they advertised it as a multimedia system first and a gaming machine second. Whereas, and then you had PlayStation, who absolutely won the marketing game that year, <laughs> turn around and basically say, this is a games console's first it's a multimedia system second and that's what and for me in terms of consoles that's what threw me and then you get nintendo and go here's our games console it does weird shit like this and it has a tentacle attachment and we're like hell yes <laughs> because nintendo because nintendo uh... <laughs> which is good i think it's good that nintendo exists just to fill that gaming void like it does some multimedia mm. functions but not many and that's yeah. fine because yeah. I want it to be something that I can just be like, this is simple, here's my games console, I'm going to curl up on my sofa and just play something. Whereas, yeah. I turn on the PlayStation and it's just sort of like, and I'm sort of going to do, I'm going to do the flop in my chair like I usually do when I'm in this situation. It's just sort of like, I want to play a <laughs> game, or I want to watch, a, watch something. It then becomes that, ex like, as dumb as it sounds, it becomes that extra decision-making process. Yeah. And for me, it's just... I prefer, like, so I, I will use that. So the reason I primarily use our PlayStation to, like, we'll come home, we'll make dinner, and we'll switch the PlayStation on, and we'll watch something on YouTube. But mm. we play games on it. It's, like, we 
both played Days Gone on it. I've got Ace Combat on there. I haven't played as many games on it recently because I'm saving a bunch of them to stream. I just need to work out with Louise when the best time to sort of dunk the PlayStation in here is because that's going to be me shepherding it to and fro. Um, ah. But it's it's very much that because I know it's a games console first, that's usually the first mm -hmm. idea that pops into my head, but then I can watch a bunch of stuff on it as well. So it's like, I don't fancy playing a PlayStation game, but I don't have a TV license. So... Yeah. My entertainment no, and... comes to the PlayStation. <laughs> and you're absolutely right. And that's why Xbox and Microsoft as a whole were in such a bad position after 2012, uh, after 2012's E3. It was because they were like, yeah, this is a multimedia console, but it does vi YouTube and video and music. And it was like, you're... That's, it, it's a console. Why are you selling it like this? And they did make a lot of bad choices with what they were going to do and the game sharing thing, which they shouldn't have made in the first place. And I, I will wholeheartedly stick to my uh, conviction at the time, which was, I don't want this console. Yep. And I didn't. I didn't want an Xbox One because of the way they sold it. It, it sounded awful. Um, and PlayStation, you, as you rightfully said, stole it away. And they were like, this is a games console, and you can do other stuff on it. Here's how you share end. a game. Bitch. Here's how you share a game. You give the game. That's it. That was the best. That was the best thing. I was like, I'm sorry, Microsoft. Like, you just got dunked. You got dunked on. Um, but it's like, what was the other thing? Like, you could sort of tell. Like, even if you just look at the design of the Xbox Ones, you can, you can see the direction they were going. Because if you look on the back, mm. it has two HDMI ports because yep. they wanted you to use it as a TV system as well. Um... It's got yeah, it's got an HD. So you so it's basically like oh yeah, what you do is you run your Skybox into your uh, Xbox and then you run it back out and it acts like a pass through. And I'm just like, how about I change the HDMI channel on the TV? Yeah, or better yet, how about I just watch YouTube if I or I just watch Sky TV if I don't have a Skybox but I have the subscription just on my Xbox without that additional step. Exactly. Like, yeah, it's... they they didn't think that through. Yeah, it's a lot of addition like i get what they're trying to do but until they basic until and i think this is what's going to happen eventually until games consoles become tvs with the mm. with the power of a computer inside of it so basically we're talking like what three or four generations of smart tv down the line mm. basically when smart tvs become comparable to games consoles then that makes sense right now yeah not at all no not at it all it was it was just a bad idea it was um and and it, it lost them out but saying that, with the introduction of our Lord and Saviour Phil Spencer, <laughs> things things have changed. <laughs> like with the whole Xbox Game Pass thing coming out, and the way that that's being run, uh, with the way Games for Gold changed, with like the games they get in, with all of the backpedaling that Phil did, and to go, yep, we we messed up, and we will we will own up that we messed up. Here's what we're going to do instead. Here's what the Xbox. One uh, S is going to be. Here's what the X is going to be, and here's what the X series is going to be. And he's made it very clear that this is a console. This is for gamers. Yes, you can do this other stuff, but look at this incredible mini fridge that isn't a mini fridge. Please don't put drinks in it. <laughs> I'm a junk of Red Bull on the top of it. <laughs> <laughs> it's got like a little dip in on, on the very top of it, which I'm like, you could put a drink on that and it could cool it. Please well, put a little cooler heated, on there. Actually. No, put a cooler on there. <laughs> but yeah um, but, this, oh. but and this is where the X series kind of <clears throat> this is where the X series has sort of made me stop and think they're trying to break into the PC market here mm. it's purely because of its design like as you say it's upright instead of laid down now laid mm. down has been the default for years why? because it fits underneath <clears throat> your TV in your little cabinet quite nicely where's that yeah. going to go? that's going to go on a computer desk mhm mm that's, it is. They're taking. They are firmly taking an artillery shot at um, at PC there. Now that's going to work. That might not work out for them though, because it mm. heavily depends on people's space, like physical space resources, and it also depends on what they want. I mean, if they want it to be like Kiddie's first PC, yeah, then that makes sense. But this is the thing. The only way, and this is a, as someone who sort of builds PCs and is primarily into that thing, the only way that makes sense to me is for people who don't quite understand how to spec a PC yet. That's mm. the only way it makes sense to me. And that's fine. If you don't understand what you're doing, then buying something pre-built isn't an issue. 
mm. as long as that you are adequately able to <coughs> upgrade it so that it stays on par. I mean, my computer, I mean, I'm running an old GeForce 970 at the moment, and I think it's giving me problems. Um, <laughs> I'm looking to upgrade because I want to turn, I basically want to pivot my computer more into a production system uh, kind of thing. So I'm looking at like a 1660 and four monitors. Like I'm going that level of crazy with this. <laughs> but again, peop uh, but a lot of people do also get bogged down in, oh, I must have the newest thing kind of thing like, I've, like and that sort of can that sort of can lead, lead people astray as well because let's say for example so we'll have the xbox x series mark one basically which is what's going to come out they're going to put it out and then when it starts to slow down and people start complaining that they can't get like better performance out of it and pcs will about outpaced it in like six months after its release they'll then put okay here's the mark two out that then becomes a price point issue because then you're going to start looking at like five year up refresh cycles possibly and you're then just going to start throwing in more powerful units again and it's just going to cost it's going to become unfeasibly expensive yeah i mean it's it's, it's going to go the way it's been since the xbox 360 kind of generation like they brought out the xbox 360 and then they brought the uh 360 elite which was again just a little bit smaller and a, a bit more powerful and then that lasted until, you know, the Xbox One. But wasn't but, the Elite also designed with, like, more memory to sort of combat the increasing... Like, cause at that yes. point in time, games suddenly went through an ex exponential increase in hard drives, uh, real estate. No, you're right, actually. Um, it did. It not only uh, increased the memory at least threefold, but it actually internalised it as well. Because before that, it was an external hard drive disk that you could clip off and then switch out for the Xbox 360. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. Um, it also dealt with so many hardware issues that the 360 did have, like the, the, the first models. The second ones that came out were fine, but then people didn't really want them because of the whole... Red Ring of Death. Listen, yeah. So they brought out the Elite version, which was like, yep, this has not got that issue anymore, and it didn't. So yeah, I suppose you're right. In, in that case, well, uh, it's, more than it's more like the current generation then. Yeah. Xbox One, Xbox One S, Xbox One X. And they've increased it, obviously, with as you've said, capability, keeping up with the PC market. Like, when VR came out, suddenly that was a big scramble for uh, console market to be like, how do we get in on this? Like, PlayStation PSVR, did that quite nicely. They did it very well. Like, they've got PSVR, and it's, from what I understand, very good. Um, yeah. Xbox teased it, and we're like, yeah, we're going to have VR in the Xbox One X. Haven't Microsoft sort of started off down the AR route as opposed to VR route, though? I remember them mentioning it a while ago. Like with like HoloLens. Hololens. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's gone under the radar. I think, I think they've killed it, to be fair. Oh, I saw something recently with it. I'm sure. Really? Maybe, that's a, they, oh. maybe, maybe that's a conversation we can pick up uh, for the next one. But if you guys out there yeah. know of anything along it, if, like, again, Tell tweet us. out, hashtag it, mm. we'll look into it. Provide links. Back everything up. Because otherwise, if you just mm. put out something that says this, I'm just going to disregard it. Source all <laughs> your information. Yes, source it. I mean, we're not currently doing that for this one. Uh, we were a bit unprepared, but uh, yeah, we just that's why. It. Yeah, that that's why we're stipulating at the beginning of all these that we can't quite remember. <laughs> yeah, um, but this is also the other thing. Like, it's it's not just that as well. It's like with the PlayStation Two. So we had the, mm. so you had the original PlayStation Two come out, and then you had Slim get released because yeah, they managed to compact it. And mm. again, with the PS3, you had the main PS3, you then had the Slim one get released. Honestly, this generation of... I would say that PlayStation has done their upgrade system better than Xbox. Mm. Because it's easier to understand. So you have your, you have your PlayStation 4, which is your bog standard, the little two-tier one. You then got... I believe there's a PS4 Slim. Let me double-check that before I start saying things. I say I, I I'm not hundred uh, percent. Yes, there is a PS4 Slim. Okay. Uh, it's marginally thinner than the uh, original PlayStation, but uh, I think we have a Slim actually. So you had the Slim one out, so it took up a bit less space and it did improvements. They then did the Pro. Now the Pro was a really good choice at the time because it then said if you want 4K, this console will do 4K. It will do all that. It's a bit power more powerful than the original PlayStation, than the PlayStation 4 and the Slim. But the PS4 Slim can still play all the games that you want. 
Mm. And that was fine. So for the people who wanted it, they could get the Pro, happy days. If you didn't want the 4K, you just wanted to play the games, you just got a slim, happy days, you can then afford more games with that money. That's dead simple to understand. You then got the Xbox One, which came out, had this really irritating power supply on it, um, that was proprietary. You then had the slip, the Xbox One S come out, which, what, how did that differ from the Xbox One, the original one? So, uh, having had both, I, cu- I currently have an Xbox One S. Uh, the S is, it's thinner and uh, a bit sleeker. It's more powerful. It's got uh, more memory by default. They've removed that clunky as shit power supply. It's just a, it's just a plug. Like standard, plug it into the back kettle lead. Um, apart from it being a little bit more powerful and a bit more compact, not really much. There's not really much difference between the standard Xbox One. So basically, it's a straight quality of life upgrade. Yep, absolutely. Which is what all Slims generally are, right? Yeah, I, I'd, I'd say they've, they've, they nailed it. Okay, now the Xbox One X. Now, I know that mm. that's 4K capable, allegedly. Yes. Um, what was the difference? Oh, it, it definitely is. Yeah, so <laughs> what were the differences then? Because if we just say the Slim is a, qu- is a qu- straight quality of life upgrade from the Xbox One, what did the Xbox One X have over the, pr- the uh, One and the One S? Um, again, pretty much the same as the Xbox One S. Xbox One X is a little bit shorter than the S. Same width, same length, a bit shorter. It's 4K capable. It's, it was something stupid, like four times as powerful as the original Xbox. Like in terms of um, processing and graphical capabilities, it's actually a bit better than the PS4 Pro as well, as far as knowledge. Uh, if, if, if I recall correctly, I don't have the exact numbers though, and that's about it really. Um, oh, as well as the fact that it, I think I believe it came with an elite controller on like day one, but again, I I'm not sure on that one. Let me. From my personal experience with One X's, I also found the build quality to be quite lacking. Oh yeah. Yeah. So the the main issue that I've had with One X's, so um, we've been through two of them. And the issue we've had with them has been the same every time. The HDMI output has ceased working. Okay. Don't know why. It doesn't work anymore. Console boots up, you just can't get an output out of it. And that's, that's been a recurring issue. So I don't know if anybody else has had that issue. But um, for it to happen repeatedly tells me that that is something that's quite easy to have happen. Huh. Because um, the, the people I know who do have them haven't really given me any kind of indication that those have been... A- um, issues, which does surprise me, because normally when Xbox does have a problem like that, it's out there immediately. I I know about it within minutes, and I need to. And I was wrong. Uh, it did not come with an Elite controller on day one. Okay, cool. Right. Um. Yeah. It's it's one of those things though. But also, I think as well with the I think Xbox na- Xbox's naming convention also confuses people as well. <laughs> yeah. Like. Yeah. I, I get you're trying to differentiate from PlayStation here, but try to do something that isn't going to confuse people who buy it. And by people I buy it, mm. I mean parents buying it for their kids. Because the minute, because the minute the grandparents or parents walk into like your local game, game PC world, whatever, and say, "Hi, I'd like to buy an Xbox for my child." Okay, okay. Would you like an Xbox One, an Xbox One S, or an Xbox One X? And you could just immediately watch the pet, watch their eyes. Just you can almost immediately see the aneurysm <laughs> about to strike because they've got no idea now. Uh, no. And then, but it's dead simple. But then you get the PlayStation. And you say because what tends to happen with the PlayStation is the slimline will just uh, sort of overwrite the original, and then mm. you. So basically, it's just, at this point, the slim doesn't exist anymore. It is the PS4. Um, whereas with the One S, you still differentiates between the one and the one s um yeah. but a lot of but then you say to people okay yeah so you want a ps4 it does this this and this uh this is the ps4 dead simple and then you say there is a ps4 pro it is a bit more powerful but they do but they both essentially do the same things except one of them outputs in 4k that's basically mm. the difference whereas with the xbox you basically have to pull up like a data sheet of all the differences <laughs> I mean, I'm exaggerating there, but there's more to it. There's a lot more to it in explaining it, and there's a lot more steps. Mm. Which just doesn't help people. No, and I, again, being uh, an Xbox gamer since the original console, I completely understand it. Like, 
I get the naming convention because I've had them all. Yeah. But to somewhat to to the layman coming in, they wouldn't have a bloody clue where to start. Exactly. <laughs> I fully I fully like, I've had to help people myself whilst in line buying a different sodding game. They've meant they've like spoken to things and mentioned things. You know, you just do that kind of standard old accidental earwigging thing of oh sorry, I, I overheard. Um, this is what you want because of X, Y, and Z. And they're like, oh, thank you so much. It's really helpful. Oh, it's so confusing, isn't it? I'm like, I know. I've been with this for years, and it's it gets me sometimes. Ha, ha, ha. But really, I'm just like, nah. I I get it, but I understand why you don't. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, I've, I've also done that because I think Nintendo learned their lesson as well because mm. the Wii U. Yeah. Which... The Wii U, Wii U. <laughs> Let's, I'm, I'm going to come out and say it. The Wii U is a tragedy. <sighs> Because it yeah. was a good console and nobody picked it up because no one knew what it was. Yeah. Um, I remember I actually, I was hanging out with some friends uh, in Canterbury once and we were in the game and they were saying, oh, um, and they were talking about a Wii U or just getting a Wii. And I said, get a Wii U. And I said, why? It's the newest console. Is it not an attachment for the Wii? No, it's a console only its own right. And I basically mm -hmm. stood there for about five, ten minutes and explained it all to them in as <laughs> simple as I could. And we're just like, yeah, it does this and this, but your Wii controllers still work with it. And that was the thing I think that threw a lot of people, because you could use your Wii remotes with it. Yep. Great idea, great conceptual idea. Lousy execution. Terrible execution. Terrible execution. <laughs> yeah. And it's, yeah, the Wii U was just a point of confusion. And I think Nintendo have learned their lesson from this, because they've just gone, all right, here's the Switch. This is the Nintendo Switch. Yeah, and then you've got... Here is our marketing. And, yeah, and then <laughs> they pulled in their knowledge from handheld by saying, here is the Switch Lite. It doesn't do, de it doesn't do um, TV mode. Yeah, which is like, actually, that's pretty bloody good. Yeah, and they, so this is what I was worried about with Nintendo, because I honestly thought, with the Switch, have they just killed their handheld market? Because you've now got a hybrid system. Not a mm. not a dedicated console like a PS4 or an Xbox, and not a uh, and not a dedicated handheld system like the DS. You have a hybrid. But what they've done is they've then introduced a lighter version of it that's cheaper and it is geared towards handheld and it's simple. That's yep. that I think was a great shout, and it just gives really people that additional flexibility. Plus, it's like that's the kind of one you want to give to kids because with the uh, fused Joy Cons instead. They can work on structural integrity, which is something that Nintendo have always been amazing at with their handheld consoles. I, I don't know about you, but my original Nintendo DS, the first model, uh, the like the kind of bluish grey silver. Yeah, I remember one, it. I dropped that thing so many goddamn times as a kid, to the point that the screen, every time I opened the screen, it would click seven times before fully opening, and then it was loose, and it still worked perfectly. For years, it never it never conks out, and it can be in standby mode with the power cable in for years. And that has been Nintendo's MO with their consoles, is longevity. Yeah, because they build them out of Nintendium. Yeah. <laughs> like, so, some of, so some of you guys might not be aware of this, but the original Game Boy, so it came out in the late 80s, if I rightly recall? The original Game Boy? So, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. this thing was a brick. In fact, is mine to hand right now? Because if it is, no, it's not to hand, that's a shame. Um, oh. it's, a, it's a brick about yeah it is about the size of a brick and yeah. some soldier out in the Gulf War I think had one oh yeah and his unit got bombed his Game Boy was hit it is now in a museum and it still works it's scorched yeah. to sin but it works like the, the power not even the power of napalm could stop Nintendo exactly <laughs> But I have had I have, do, have had a couple of issues with <clears throat> they have Nintendo as much as we love them they have had some build issues over the years. Mm. So uh, like my DS so I had DS a DS Lite and eventually because of the amount of use I had the uh, restrictive bit for the hinge just broke so it just flops oh, about yeah. like a dead fish now it doesn't hold itself up. Um, so I was actually half considering taking it to someone and getting it turned into a Game Boy Macro. Because if you take the top screen off of a DS, you then basically just have a Game Boy. Uh, well, a DS Lite, I should say, because they did away with the Game Boy slot after that. That was a good shout as well. Like the DS being reverse compatible with Game Boys. Yeah, that was yeah, a it was. blinding shout. <laughs> it was bloody brilliant, because it was like, oh, cool, I've got this uh, Nintendo DS now. Oh, what am I going to do with my Game Boy? Oh, shit. 
and then it's like, wait, I can play my uh, Game Boy Color and my Game Boy Advance games on my DS. Oh, you can do Hell color yeah. games. Uh, on the original one, you could do color games. Oh, on the really? DS Lite, they yeah, oh. yeah, you absolutely could. On the um, on the DS Lite, they removed that and just had uh, GBA. Yeah, well, that's why yeah. I kept my Advance SP then, was just so I could keep playing my Game Boy Color games. Oh, I, I kept my Advance SP as well for the same purpose. Oh yeah, um, <laughs> I think it was amazing. But yeah, the other issue they had, and this is actually an issue that's come up again recently. So you might have seen articles floating around about Nintendo's having Nintendo Joy Cons having drift issues, and this is actually an issue I've encountered. This is because the material they make the stick, the internal bits of the sticks, wears away and creates a powder. This was an issue they had with the Nintendo 64 controller. So they haven't quite learned the lesson, but if you know what to do, you can kind of clear the issue with the Joy-Con. So if you like, so this might be a public service announcement for people. <laughs> you only need to buy an, a single item, and that is a can of compressed air. Um, so if you look underneath your Joy-Con, you will see there's like a li uh, your Joy-Con stick, sorry. You'll see there is a little skirt on it. If you lift that up with a flathead screwdriver, just enough so you can insert the straw from a can of air under it and blast it, you can clear a lot of that residue from the sensors. The next thing you need to do is you then need to run a recalibration, which is dead simple. You just follow it, do it as, do it as slow or as quick as you like, and that will help re-zero the controller and then update the firmware on the controllers because i didn't know actually that the joy cons have their own firmware mm. so you have to run regular updates for them so you just do that and nine and i think about a good 75 percent of the time it clears the issue for a while it will come back until they get the wear issue sorted out but at least for the time being it's a it's a fix until they run out new joy cons that are better and won't have that issue well, you, you say that. They actually did um, the... I, I don't know when you bought your Nintendo Switch, um, but we got ours pretty much straight away when it came out. Right. Maybe like three months after it was released, we sold our Wii U, saved up a bit of money, and got that as like a, yay, I've got a job present. Um, and they've released a newer version of the Nintendo Switch, literally just an updated version. It's oh, exactly yeah, with the improved same. battery life and things. Yeah, exactly. But they did apparently also improve the firmware and hardware capabilities of those joy cons when they shipped them as well okay interesting however however <laughs> people did then come not as many people but some people did come back going yeah so i'm now getting this drift problem ah. um, not as many people but it was still reported so i think it is like like you said it is just something that they've they need to tweak maybe it's like one of their suppliers or something Mm. or the people who manufacture them they just need to make a small change in whatever they're using yeah um but they they are circumventing the issue if not fixing it outright yeah i mean a circumvention of the issue can just be as good as a fix sometimes it just depends mm. yeah it, 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 it depends on who gets the issues really yeah and that's very very typical in general Let's talk about the year, because this is so. This is a very special time of year because we are entering a new decade. We're re-entering the twenties, oh. and yeah, so it's the end of twenty nineteen. So year-long wrap-up. What has happened in the world of gaming in twenty nineteen? Jesus Christ! Um. No, that didn't happen this year. <laughs> what? Uh, what has happened in the year of twenty? Gaming. So we also so we touched on already that Corsair have bought um, Scuff and Elgato, um, but in sort of more in sort of easier to digest things. So there's been a whole slew of games come out that have been absolutely incredible. Yes. Oh, okay. In that case, please allow me to start with one of the biggest uh, surprises of the year. Then. Hello, Kitty Island Adventure. One of the second biggest surprises <laughs> of the year. <laughs> um, no, EA, Evil Associated, Evil made Arsholes. a good. They made a good game. Oh yes. And they made a good. They made a good single player game. That's also a fucking Star Wars game. Right. Okay. With Jedi Fallen Order. Okay, I want to jump in on this. So basically, when Fallen Order came out, all the reviewers that I follow, so Jim Sterling, Yong Ye, Sid Alpha to a degree, <laughs> they all basically turned around and said. Uh, breaking weather report, hell has frozen over because EA made a good <laughs> Star Wars game. <laughs> and what makes this even sweeter 
is how EA for years have basically been trying to say, Nobody cares about single player games. They only want multiplayer <laughs> live services. With and then they make a very successful single player game. And it's just like the gaming community just went, and fuck you, EA. <laughs> Which is what whilst, I've been saying whilst, for years. While simultaneously shoveling money at them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which I'll admit, I did. I gave them £35 through CD keys. And I got... Oh. No, I know. But it was because it was on sale. Uh, <laughs> and I was like... I'm gonna get it. I heard it went for um, like ten. I heard somebody managed to just wrangle it for like ten dollars on the Epic Store. Ooh. The only reason I go ooh is because it's the Epic Store. Um, yeah. <laughs> but bloody hell, really, ten bucks? Um. Well, no. So I, I, okay, I got it for thirty-five pounds, but I got the uh, the deluxe edition because that was what was on sale, and the original one was still like fifty, yeah. uh, or like forty-five or whatever. But I got this on sale for thirty-five pounds. Um, it was at a point of uh, actually mental health problems so i didn't even play it so i got it thinking it made me feel better and it didn't but moving away from that i then when i did get to playing it when i felt less like crap i was immediately taken by just the opening the opening was a beautiful game rendered cinematic cutscene uh with your your character calcestus and his friend uh i can't remember the name of the planet because it's literally just a throwaway junk planet um but the Star Wars nerds out there are probably screaming at me, going, this is the name of the planet, you bitch. Um, <clears throat> which, fair enough, I understand. Um, Some say it's, but that planet is based on EA's creative ability. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Um, but anyway, and uh, like that, that first little junk planet where you're going through, I'm not going to spoil any part of the story because everyone who listens to this needs to play that game if you haven't. But you just going through this first little planet is your tutorial and it is an incredibly well done tutorial like it introduces your character Calcestus. it introduces um you know his his call to action what he's been doing how long he's been there why he's there because this is at the point after episode three after order 66 has been uh given this is like five years after or something and so this is his kind of thing of how did he get there no, that's not explained until later. But it's his, his kind of how the hell? What, what, why is he here? What's what's going on? What's the outside world like? And you get small little hints as to the fact that this place is being watched by the Empire as well. Like you don't notice it unless you're actively looking for it, which is why I'm giving you this hint. Look for like the Imperial droids, like the you know those little eh, 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 things. Yeah. The probe. Notice droids. where they are. Yeah, probe, probe droids. That's the one. Thank you. Notice where they are because it's very subtle. Um, but that gives away a lot of like the story later on. And moving through it, you learn of Cal's story and his struggle. You learn of you know a bit more about the Jedi Order. He's got a unique little ability that lets you uh, see Force echoes, little rifts in time in, in in the Force. That's kind of like people did this at this point. You know where strong emotions and things happened. Um, it's like a, a unique ability to Cal. And it's basically just a way of like exploring the lore of the worlds and everything that you visit. That in itself is incredible because it gives you so much backstory and so much flavor to these places you're going, which are already gorgeous and fleshed out. And the more you visit them, the more you the more you see. And you have to go back to them when you unlock new force powers and things because certain paths are blocked. And they change organically as well with the story. Cal changes organically with the story. The way he interacts with his little robot buddy, BD, changes with the story. Like, just... Uh, his voice lines and stuff will change all of those amazing little things including all the way down to customizing your lightsaber from the emitter to the switch to the material it's made out of to the color like i i cannot give this game enough praise it is fantastic and the only thing i will maybe say is bad um is like the very few technical Kind of glitches like the, the the standard obvious ones you get of like oh i'm in the floor oh no i'm not or like that enemy has done a strange 180 but still stabbed me in the chest kind of thing <laughs> they're very few and far between standard game glitches that you'd expect to see in this day and age, especially from ea um <laughs> well to be fair at least with ea all the characters faces rendered properly on day one yeah that's actually a thing there's been none of that um just eyeballs and teeth nonsense. <laughs> like, 
<laughs> that Ubisoft is famous for. Which was so... I, <laughs> like, this is the thing. It made major news as, over here as well. So it's like you just... So on BBC News, you just see the floating head and it just makes me crease up every time. <laughs> it's one of the funniest images I've ever seen in my life. Oh, see, it's so good. Now, this is, a th- now, this is where a lot of people are going to sort of, like, give me shit. So I mm. haven't bought an EA game since before Origin came out. I have had an active boycott on EA since Origin uh, started because I disagreed with how EA ran it. I disagreed with a lot of the terms of service behind Origin. I disagreed with a lot of things. As time's gone on, EA's business practices have become my objection. And like, we're looking at the creators of Dead Space. Like, they set impossible marks for Dead Space, and they're basically been coming up with reasons to shut the studio down. I mean, the big one we're going to talk about... In fact, let's keep it on EA for a moment. Let's talk about Anthem. Oh, let's. Oh, dear. Anthem. Ooh, yes. Now, <laughs> I'd already made up my mind that I wasn't going to buy Anthem because it was an EA game. I watched the trailer and I was like, ah, shit, this looks like a game that I'd actually enjoy, but it's made by EA. Mm. Like, the last time I had that was... So, when Titanfall was first announced... I watched the trailer for it, and basically my reaction to it, the whole thing was just like, kept running and gunning, yes. Doing crazy wall jumps, yes. Big fuck off mechs, yes. Big fuck off mech fights, <laughs> yes. EA, I'm not interested anymore. <laughs> that was literally my live reaction to that video. And, yeah. And it was just like, and then with Anthem with that, it just looked somewhat interesting. And then... Then I heard the magical words about Anthem, that it was a live service. And then I said to myself, that game's going to flop. Absolutely going to flop. There was also a rumour that I cannot confirm, but apparently at the Anthem release event in the UK, some, there were some uh, chocolates made up that had Anthem wrappers on it, and it also had the percentage of the, uh, of the cocoa in the chocolate. Coincidentally, the... Cocoa percentage of the chocolate matched the Metacritic review. <laughs> like, this is the thing. I've been watching Anthem. I've been watching it as it's been going, and I've slowly stopped hearing about it because I think nobody gives a damn anymore. Mm. But it looks like... Oh, God. It just looks horrendous. It looks like... I can't even begin to describe what it looks like. It's just bad. It's absolutely so, bad. From what I understand, because, again, I haven't played it... Um... <clears throat> I didn't want to shell out that money on it straight away. I, I wanted to see how it how it did, and maybe see if it um, turned into a okay. Yeah, this was a, a tire fire at the beginning, but they've actually doused the tires. It's not on fire anymore. They've even repurposed some of them, and they can be used on a unicycle that's a bit wobbly but does its purpose. But instead, what happened like, was it well, it was a tire fire to start. They poured napalm on it. Now the whole city's <laughs> on fire, and um, it now resembles Australia. <laughs> inhospitable and full of spiders no i'm um, saying because li- australia is literally on fire at the moment oh shit you're right <laughs> um i'm very sorry australia I yeah we're very sorry soon. that your politicians are screwing you over australia we love you all uh, please I also call really us cunts on... because there's nothing more appreciate appreciated than an aussie calling you a cunt it's true it's really weird like just to go on a very quick tangent, I've been cu- I was called uh, a cunt by an Australian no more than about two weeks ago. Um, it's refreshing, isn't it? It was amazing. Like it was just so- someone who came into our office to do a bit of training, and I had a, s- a quick chat with him in the break room whilst I made myself uh, a cup of tea, and I can't remember what we were talking about, but I was like, "All right, you know, good luck with your training, mate. All the best." He's like, "Ah, I will you do as he cunt," and I was just like, "Oh my god." This is the best thing. Like yeah, it's I genu- it's, it's I genu- so positive, isn't it? Yeah, I genuinely had like the biggest grin on my face. But it's, it's like a nice cold glass of water on a warm summer's day. Yeah, it's oddly refreshing. Yeah. Anyway, anyway, I'll, yes. Anyway, back, off the bushfires. To, back, back to Anthem, which is the bushfire. Which is a different bushfire. Year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, that yeah, that tire fire. So uh, a lot of my news from Anthem has come from um, Inside Gaming. Um, fantastic little YouTube channel, um, spearheaded by Lawrence Sontag. And the last little thing they did, which was uh, about a month and a half ago now, maybe, maybe even two months ago, was that the developer at the time was like, yep, we hear you, we understand, we know that we've not uh, delivered as we promise, but we 
genuinely want to fix this. We have a team of people who are dedicated to getting this to you in the vision that we have for it. It's going to take a while, but we're going to do it. And it felt really bad because at the time, my reaction to that was, he genuinely cares about this game. Oh, that poor baby. That's the sad I... thing because EA are already making his noose. They're already making yeah. that company's noose. That noose was already around his neck. Mate, he was in straight denial. Honestly, after Mass Effect and Andromeda, I'm amazed Bioware <laughs> hasn't been axed yet. Yeah, same. And oh, I, I hope they, they hope they aren't because I love Bioware. See, They're so good. What there was one thing that made me really angry about EA buying Bioware. <coughs> it wasn't for the. It wasn't because of Kozo or anything. It was because literally one of the single greatest RPGs that I've ever played is never going to get a sequel. And that no. game. And that game is Sonic Chronicles: The Dark Brotherhood. Oh my God, I forgot about that game. It is literally possibly one of the best Sonic games I've ever played, and one of the best RPGs I've ever played. It was on DS. It was really, really good. So you had a party of four characters, which you could switch from various characters of the Sonic universe. It was quite different. It wasn't your typical, oh, let's defeat Eggman kind of thing. Like, you actually teamed up with Eggman to a degree. It brought in a new character and uh, called Shade the Echidna, and it actually explored more of Knuckles' uh, realm of the Sonic world, which was quite nice. And it was really well done. It was really well executed, and I loved every second of it. The art style was fantastic. Uh, the worlds were immersive, the story was decent, it, was, it wasn't it was voiced, it was all text. It was bloody brilliant. And the ending, it was perfectly left on a cliffhanger, um, perfectly set up for the next game, and then EA buys Bioware. <laughs> yeah. Like, that, that one belongs in top 10 anime betrayals. Um... <laughs> And, oh, th and quite frankly, and I have played the three Mass Effect games. I may not have bought an EA game since Origin came out, but I did go around to my brother-in-law's and play um, a bunch of uh, EA games that I didn't spend money on. Um, and I loved the Mass Effect games. <coughs> uh, I started on two, loved it, played three, loved two more than three, and that's where I stopped. Um, mm. But yeah, it's it's one of those things where it's just... You can see a company that's done so much good over the years, like Knights of the Old Republic, Mass Effect 2, um, Sonic Chronicles, and then they get absorbed by EA, and you just, what, it's, it's like you're just, you're watching somebody pull the plug on the life support, and you know they're pulling the plug just so they can get their inheritance that extra week sooner, and you're just watching the poor patient as the light slowly fades from their eyes. That might have been a bit visceral, but it's it's how it feels. You're pretty spot on to be. Yeah, and that's uh, it's just been a shame. It's just a shame it's to upsetting. watch. I firmly believe that Bioware is in its death throes right now, and I I just I can't wait for the class close, uh, closed casket funeral. I can't wait for it. It's just end the suffering now. The, I think the only thing that could bring it back from the brink of death would be Kotor three, but they won't do it. I know they won't. Honestly. I don't want to see EA do KOTOR 3. I'd... No, I don't want to see EA do it. No, but... Honestly, I if want we Bioware were... to... <laughs> No, I don't want Bioware to do it either. Really? I want Obsidian to do it. Okay. Because Obsidian no, did KOTOR 2. Now, one thing that I want to see is I would absolutely love to see Obsidian buy the KOTOR front, like... Obviously, this EA being exclusive making Star Wars games is... That's got to be a limited contract thing. And the House of Mouse has got to have seen all the controversy with Battlefront 2, the insect, the literal gambling that got US senators and multiple countries altering their laws to compensate for it. They've got to look at that and think, yeah, maybe these guys aren't the best people to be doing this with. <laughs> and I hope they go, yeah, no more exclusivity for you. Go away, go away. Uh, let's see what some other people have to say. I would quite honestly like it if Obsidian were able to buy the KOTOR name or, and do KOTOR 3. Also remaster and re-release KOTORs 1 and 2. And the big one I want to see remastered is KOTOR 2. Because mm. KOTOR 2 isn't finished. No. No, it's not. Now, if you have KOTOR 2 on Steam, there is a mod that will unlock 
all the content that is in the game, but you can't access because the game was released unfinished. And if you do do, if they were to do that, I would love to see Kotor 2 finished as it was intended to be played. Mm. And that for me would be a complete game changer to just go through Kotor 1 all the way to Kotor 2 and then find out this mystery Kotor 3 as to what that would ever be and see how that pans out. That would be good. Especially if you can sort of, it gives you a bit more flexibility because with Kotor, the one thing of nowadays that definitely lets it down is it's got, it's only got a real binary to it, which <coughs> is you either be Jedi or you be Sith. I would like mm. to see Grey Jedi looked at a bit more because yeah. of one character in particular from the Star Wars universe, and that is Starkiller. Anybody who knows my love of Star Wars knows uh, I love the Force Unleashed games, and when we lost Force Unleashed 3, a little bit of me died inside, because I will never know what happened! <laughs> I've actually encountered a couple of people who were planning Force Unleashed 3 on Reddit. I've actually encountered them a couple of times, and I have asked them, do you still have an active NDA, and can you tell me anything about it? And the answer has always been, yes, the NDA is still active. No, I can't talk about it. And the answer for me is, fuck! <laughs> Damn it. Because, oh. again, it's another one of those games. Left on a massive cliffhanger, ready for the next one, would have been absolutely mm. incredible, and... Pfft. Axed. It's, ne it's not happening, guys. It's not happening. Uh, and it's not. That's, that's, mm -hmm. this, is what, this is what pain is for me. And, like... <laughs> Games that have got a sequel that are never going to happen. Oh, dude, I've got one of those. What one of my favorite series, actually, going back to the Game Boy, uh, the Game Boy Advance, which is Golden Sun. There was ah yes, Golden Sun and Golden Sun: The Lost Age were two of my favorite Game Boy Advance games ever made. They're so incredible, I and I, I still go back and play them now because they hold up really well. See, one thing I'm considering doing is. I would like to play some old Game Boy games that I never got to play, and I'd have to emulate them to make it work for stream. Because I would like to stream them yeah. if I'm going to do it. That's the thing. I've got both uh, Golden Sun and The Lost Age. I've got their cartridges. Um, and I'm like, I can show the cartridges on a stream and go, I got them. I'm allowed to do this. Because I've kept those games for the years because they're so near and dear to me. They brought out a third one. Uh, which is years later following the, the children of like, the main protagonists from the first two games. Mm -hmm. And it was, on, it was on the DS. It looked fairly good. Um, it was a complete bombshell. It tanked. And it was the most disheartening thing because they had some incredible characters. They had lovely gameplay, brilliant visuals. And it was, like, following, it was a perfect follow-on from the end of uh, Lost Age, the second game in the series. Because it's like... I, I, without going too much into the story, it was like the whole point of the first two games was that the world was slowly crumbling away. It was literally dying because the force that had uh, created it, alchemy in its entirety, was shut off. It was locked away. And you work to fix that. And then the third one is the complete opposite. The world is coming back. New races are being like formed because of like the burst of it in the beginning. And... Uh, new new continents, new oceans, new everything is being made, also causing problems, uncontrolled, and there's this whole thing, and like at the very end, you feel like you've helped to temper the problem. Massive cliffhanger happens. I haven't heard a damn thing for over a decade. A decade. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, most Half Life fans can. Get in solidarity, but lol, they've got a new One. game coming. Yeah, they've got what? Half Life Alex! Which is basically what, 1.5? I'm, I'm not mistaken. I'm not sure, but it is a VR game. Now, that's something <clears throat> we should talk about for year in review VR. Yes, VR. Now, I remember a couple years ago, I stumbled upon a trailer for a game that had some really nice music for it. Mm. And. It also featured you wielding a couple of swords. And I guess you guys know where I'm going with this. It was the trailer for Beat Saber. Yeah. Now, I have been following VR ever since I saw v Beat Saber. Now, VR is still quite in its infancy. It's getting there. And I think there's a few games out at the moment. Stand a chance to really um, make VR worth it. 
And while PSVR is doing its thing independently, still PC VR needs the work. Now, the games in mind that I'm thinking of doing are, one, Beat Saber, because that will just get everybody in, because it's just like, ha 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 waves arms frantically. Um, <laughs> but, the other, but there's a few other ones. Uh, one of them, if you like your shooters, is Pavlov, which is basically Counter-Strike VR. Um, the other ones, there are two that I've seen this year. There's Half-Life Alex, which is, lol, Half-Life, it's going to make bank. Oh, yeah. And then the other one is one that I discovered recently, which is Boneworks. Now, Half-Life were meant to dis- uh, do a demo at the Game Awards recently. They pulled out last minute. I think it might be because of Boneworks. Now, Boneworks is a VR game which has a bit of a little bit of you play a character who's jammed on a VR headset and you're now in a virtual world. So you're sort of VRing VR at this point. <laughs> now, I've watched a bit of the gameplay for it. I've watched the trailer. And do you know what vibes it gives me? Go on. Half-Life. Oh, really? really makes me think it looks like a Half-Life game. I mean, obviously, not Gordon Freeman, but the general atmosphere just makes me think Half-Life. And I'm looking at this game, and the more I look at it, the more I'm thinking, I really need to buy this game. I really need to drop a thousand pounds on a Valve Index and get <laughs> this game. I need this game in my life. That's basically where I'm at with it. And there's... Now that I'm starting to get excited for a few of the titles out there, because they look high enough quality, and the VR headsets technology has come along far enough that I believe VR sickness might soon be on the cusp of either being a rarity or just a non-issue. Mm. Um, but it's it's getting quite exciting. It's get VR as a in a hot as a whole is getting quite excited, especially now that Valve are now producing their own stuff. Oh, I know. Because That's I reckon, spooky. because I reckon VR is where the bottleneck's been for Valve for so long. Because Gabe has always said he's wanted to be like Nintendo. He's wanted Valve to be not only making their own hardware but making their own games. So I reckon, with the advent of uh, Index, we are going to see a lot more games from Valve. Because aside from Half Life, Alex, I know there's other games in the in the works. You know what would really make money? Left 4 Dead 3. See, that's the first thing that popped into my head, especially in VR. The second thing that popped into my head was Portal. Ah, uh, just actually could, no. Could I, you imagine Portal Three in VR? No, what I could Im- actually, yes, I can, and it goes a bit like this. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I imagine Portal Three in VR. Uh, it's yeah. just going to be people vomiting everywhere because. And the- you don't think that's fantastic, <laughs> <laughs> mate? As much as I got quite like the idea of like doing crazy stuff in VR, just absolutely breaking people's. Uh, breaking people's perception of space time <laughs> not so much like it's fine when you're sort of uh, looking at a screen and you're sort of like quite passive but vr makes you quite active in it so you are experiencing oh, yeah. it and you're just like oh holy shit i think i dropped That's some what I'm acid saying. Could, you, could you not imagine the sheer horror on someone's face as they've set up an infinite loop of themselves like the, the you know the, the the standard ones where they're falling just constantly and then they just hit a portal and just go sent flying off into space. Could you not imagine oh. someone's someone's face as that happens? That'd be amazing. You know what? I've got a cracking business venture now. I've got a cracking go business on. idea. VR gyms. They exist. Okay, I need one. I need to go I need to go <laughs> to one. Genuinely, like like I got I've been I used to go to the gym and I quite enjoyed it, but I haven't been mm. able to go in recent years because it's expect prohibitively expensive for me at the mm. moment but it's also that i really want to be able to i want to do exercise that i enjoy so for example i quite enjoy sword play so a game like blade and sorcerer would be ideal for me because it'd yeah. just be i have a sword i'm gonna go stab this guy or hello you i've just put my hands on your shoulders oh there's a spiked wall here slam um <laughs> that's the kind of thing i want to do and one of the other things as well that I really want to see take off is VR treadmills. Mm. I've, I've seen a few like the Omni and a few others that are like bowls that you can walk on. And honestly, if you put me in Payday 2 VR, give me a week, I'll come out looking like Arnie. <laughs> like, give me a week in Payday 2 VR, I'll, I'll, you won't recognise me. I will be ripped. It, or at the very least, I will have conditioning enough to rival that of the SAS. <laughs> bold statement yeah let's let's train hayden to be like the sas through the medium of payday 2 vr oh uh 
one of my favorite games, uh, Sekiro Shadows Die Twice, one game of the year. Ah, nice. Which is brilliant because it is a fantastic game from the developers from Software of the devilishly difficult uh, Soulsborne series. Yes. Um, starting from Demon Souls, Dark Souls 1, 2, and 3, as well as Bloodborne. Um, an amazing series of games. The, the only one I've not played uh, are Demon Souls and Bloodborne because I don't own a PlayStation. But yeah, um, Se- Sekiro Shadows Die Twice. Uh, I would wholeheartedly recommend it. Um, set in, I believe it's supposed to be uh, Edo, uh, the, the Edo era. The yeah. Japan. Um, obviously, it's uh, fantastical because you know, you've got beasts and monsters and ghosts and things. But I misheard just... you there and thought you said goats instead of ghosts. And I was just like, goats aren't they? <laughs> oh, wait, no, he said ghosts. That's the problem with uh, still being very throaty and unwell. Yeah. Um, this will not be the case for the next recording. But um, yeah, it's just a fantastic game uh, full of a lot of hidden lore, as is from Software's thing. Marvelous combat. As opposed to Dark Souls kind of block and dodge combat, it's block and deflect. Like you are clashing swords mm. and it is constant. It's not like stop, roll back, get your stamina. It's you need to block and then you need to attack and you need to block and counter and attack and deflect and attack. It's constant, fast-paced um, combat as opposed to Dark Souls more slower, hit hard and run. Um but very similar play style otherwise. And yeah, marvellous story, beautiful scenery, loads of hidden surprises. Very worthy of its Game of the Year title. Well done, Sekiro. Go play it. Okay, so as you said, Sekiro run uh, Game of the Year. I can't comment Ooh. on that, so I'm not going to try. Uh, but actually, there's, it is a game, there are a couple of games in this list I do want to touch on. Uh, namely, uh, The Outer Worlds. Yes, Outer Worlds. So I've been hearing a lot of things, and the main thing that I've heard people say is temper your expectations. Yes. Because pe- a lot of people have been like heralding it as this is uh, Obsidian giving Bethesda the middle finger for Fallout and all that jazz, <laughs> and they're going in expecting the second coming of Christ, which is not the correct thing to do. Go oh. in, uh, treat it at, like, think of it as it's like a Skyrim slash Fallout slash whatever style experience, but don't compare it to another game until you finish it, until or until you've at least played it for a significant amount of time. Yeah, I will be aiming to pick it up as soon as uh, Epic uh, get their greedy little mitts off it. Um, I have played The Outer Worlds because it's on Xbox Game Pass. Okay. And again, I have an Xbox, so I don't none of that Epic Store bollocks. The only thing I have on there is Satisfactory, but we'll get into that in a minute. And I have played it. Hayden's face. You have an Epic and Store account. Hayden is absolutely right. Uh, Outer Worlds is a fun game. It is very uh, kind of Fallout 3, Fallout New Vegas-esque. Just kind of in space. Don't go in there being like, this is going to be the best thing ever, because I didn't think that. I've got to a specific point, and I've just kind of been like, eh, I've not bothered to go back. It's not bad. It's just not the best thing, and n- nothing's kind of triggered me to go back and continue playing it. So let's go back to the game of the some of the other Game of the Year contenders. Smash Brothers Ultimate doesn't really mean to be much said. It's a Smash Brothers game. It was going to be up there regardless. Uh, That's good. Control. Now, Control is an interesting one. I haven't really played much of it because I want to stream it, but it's made by the people who developed a game called Alan Wake. Alan Wake is a fantastic story-driven horror experience, and I have quite a big fondness for that game. And apparently there's some sort of link to Alan Wake in Remedy, but from what I've been hearing and from what little I've seen of it, there is a damn bloody good game and it's really interesting and i genuinely am quite intrigued to play it and see where they go with it anything to add on that jordan um i've seen i've not seen much about it it's actually flown pretty uh far above my radar which is again uh kind of annoying and surprising because i loved alan wait um i'm probably going to wait until it becomes available on the xbox probably with game pass because again money yeah um play the crap out of it there. I thought Control was a PS4 it's... exclusive. Oh no, it's on the <laughs> Epic Store. It's an Epic Store exclusive. My, middle, Epic fi- exclusive. my middle fingers are in the air, people. Okay. Yeah, uh, but that ep- that's, that's the thing. Epic, Epic Store exclusive doesn't necessarily mean not console, because a few Epic Store games are available on the console. Um, yeah. And they do become available on Game Pass. So if I can get it, I will. Uh, let's talk about the other two interesting titles, and then we're not hmm. going to go as in-depth, because we've been talking for quite a while. 
we uh, have. Resident Evil 2 Remake. Yes. Now, I've never played a Resi game. I've watched people Not. play Resi games. And I've watched people play Resi 2, Resi 2 Remake. Mm. Honestly, it looks so much fun. I'm actually tempted to pick it up myself. Same. And play it. I've also watched people play Resident Evil 7, which looks legitimately horrifying and fuck off with that. And the fact that that's in <laughs> VR is hysterical. Like, there, yeah. there was a meme at one point. There was a picture somebody posted on the internet of Res Evil 7 on their screen, a VR headset, and they put a bucket in the middle of their room with some cushioning over it. <laughs> Res Evil 2 remake looks solid. Looks, it looks kind of mm. like the standard of what I want to see from older games being reimagined kind of thing, or redone. So, like, like for example, I'd Absolute. love to see the original Legend of Zelda redone mm. and sort of brought up to modern That'd standards. Be interesting. Especially the second one as well. But with, um, with Resi 2, it looks like they're going along the same path with Resident Evil 3's yes. re- uh, remake, which has just been announced. Yes, that's, that's looking quite good, and I am quite looking forward mm. to one of my favourite YouTubers playing it. I'm going to watch him play it and have a great time. Same. Death Stranding. Death Stranding. Now, we can't really can't talk, talk about we it. Can't, not played it. We can't talk much about it. One, because we haven't played it. No. And two, because I refuse to look at it because I want to play it. Uh, but Death yeah, Stranding same. is made from is uh, Hideo Kojima's new game after his uh, departure from Konami because Konami are unbelievable idiots. <laughs> it's got Norman Reedus and the Amazing Feeders and about and beyond that, it, I've heard it's basically Amazon Delivery Man Simulator. Yeah, uh, it's quite but, realistic um... in the sense that you need to go to the toilet every so often. You need to mm. look after yourself. You need to balance your loads correctly and all of this good stuff. Yeah, I mean, from what I've heard from a good friend of mine whose opinion I trust, he enjoys the game. He said that it's very much geared to the audience who likes taking their time. Um, And even though the world feels lonely, it's big and it's vast, but he doesn't feel like that necessarily means empty. I asked him to stop at that point, but that stuck with me. That sounds right up my alley. Right, game of the decade. That's the question now. Oh, that is the question, and I am That's, absolutely terrified for this. Hard. This... Because it's like, my game of the decade, there are so many games, it's been a fantastic decade of games. Yeah, I mean... But... <laughs> let's, okay, let's, go, let's, let's do this in the style of the, uh, of the Game Awards then. Let's, find a, let's get a top five together, and, okay. and, sort, of, and sort of go from that. So this this is just a general our our personal game of the decade. We're not um, we're not saying this has got to carry any weight. We're just sort of putting it in there. Okay. So my nominations for my top five for my game of the decade are Payday Two, Undertale, yep. XCOM Two, including War of the Chosen, Highway Blossoms, and Hellblade: Senua's Sacrifice. Okay. Yeah. It's really fucking difficult to choose, and I'm gonna I'm gonna quickly do my honourable mentions now. My honourable mentions are uh, Legend of Zelda: Breath of the Wild, Heart of the Woods, uh, developed by Studio Elan, and My Time at Portia. Okay. Oh shit! I need to add another game of the decade. Uh... <laughs> Doom. Okay, I'm making it six. Pick Doom. six. Okay. Right. Damn it. Okay. Um, um, all right. Well. So in that case, I've got my top five. Okay. What's your top five? So we have Subnautica. Okay. Dark Souls 3. Yeah. Specifically 3. Mm-hmm. Fire Emblem Awakening. I'm, I'm actually going to put in uh, Sekiro as well. Okay. And for number 6, I'm actually going to put Pokemon Omega Ruby. Okay. That's a pretty good show. Right. I've, okay. I've come, ac- I've come across a conundrum now. So let's, let's do it. So I'm going to give you the reasons for my recommendations. So Payday 2 is one of the reasons that I have the friendship group that I do now, that I play with. So, because Payday 2 started out with me, my girlfriend Louise, and our, and our friends Locke and Irish. Uh, we played Payday together, and that was it. We did that solidly for about a year and a half, and then we started playing other games together. Undertale was recommended to me, and it was hands down one of the best streams I've ever done in my life. I, like, when I streamed it, I had so much fun doing it. I loved that game. Uh, despite the salt I generated from my viewers. <laughs> XCOM 2. XCOM 2 is a brilliant strategy game. I absolutely love it. It's great that you can sort of make your friends in the game and hope they don't die, and then let them get mad at you when you do die. Uh, Highway Blossoms. Highway Blossoms is a visual novel developed by... It was developed by Alienworks, but it's now been handed over to a combination of Studio Coattails and Studio Elan. 
Uh, brilliant uh, LGBT love story. Uh, I wholeheartedly recommend you check it out. And beyond that, I'm not going to say anymore. It just got me into the whole medium of visual novels. Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice. Now, Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice is an adventure game that explores uh, a character who suffers with psychosis. And it's arguably one of the best games I've played all, all decade. I absolutely love it. The story is well delivered. You, when, when you wear headphones, you, genuinely, you get people actually talking in your ears in the right positions as they were recorded. And lastly, Doom. Because motherfucking Doom! Doom. Right. <laughs> I think I know who my winner is. Yeah, well, let's... Tell you what, save it. Okay. Think on it a bit. Yeah. Um, I'll, go, I'll, I'll quickly go through mine then. So, starting off with Dark Souls 3. Mm -hmm. um, perfect way to end the Souls series. Uh, all of the hidden story brings everything together perfect. Everything together perfectly. Um, it's learnt from its uh, mistakes and its good points from both Dark Souls One, Two, and from Bloodborne. And it's just visually gorgeous. The world is so bright and vibrant, despite how desolate and dead it is. I have played it multiple times and will no doubt do so again. It's sp spectacular. Okay. Um, Fire Emblem Awakening. Kind of the same thing. Uh, I've played it so many times and will do so. All of the characters are engaging and fascinating. There's not a single one that I wouldn't with or as. It's gorgeous. The story is amazing and the sound is what gets me. That mingles in with the story so well that I could forget what I'm doing. There's one track on there called Don't Speak Her Name. And I would rec when you play it, get to that point and you'll understand what I mean. Next, Pokemon Omega Ruby. Ruby was my, f was my favorite by far, and I feel that they did naught but improve on it. That was the game that they introduced the idea of multiple uh, timelines, which is confirmed within the Pokemon universe. <laughs> uh, they increased all of my favorite aspects about Ruby, like the secret bases. Um, they added in Mega Evolutions of Sceptile, my baby boy, and just, I, I can't fault it personally. It's a a fantastic nostalgia trip with all of the bells and whistles. I can't actually remember what I said, the rest of them. So I'm actually just going to stick with those. Okay, cool. Like, yeah, those, those are my top three. A lot of people uh, are aware that I'm a bit of a fan of Doom. A little bit. Amy, you, you, you know how much. Um, I can't award it to Doom, though. I have to award it by right to Hellblade. For one reason and one reason only. So, Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice was an indie game. When you look at it, it looks like a triple-A game, which led a lot of people to refer to it as what's known as a double-A game. I recently watched the development diaries for Hellblade. They're all on YouTube, there's 30 of them, they're on the Ninja Theory YouTube channel. And the way they were so inventive in making the game, and just making this experience on the money they did so like for, for example recently i heard i think it was call of duty the advertising campaign for call of duty was 200 million dollars on its own i i don't have that figure in front of me so don't quote me on it i could be wrong guess how much it cost to make hellblade significantly less the game was developed on a budget of 10 million dollars which is vastly reduced from most AAA games. And they did it, and they did it well. And the second game has just been announced with an amazing trailer, which I then learned all the runic words for the song in the trailer, because <laughs> I'm a nerd like that. Just the atmosphere this game provides, how, the way it sucks you in, the way that when you hear the voices that Senua hears in her head, and you hear the narrator and she is literally whispering behind your left ear and you have to ignore every fibre of your being that tells you to turn your head and look at her because she's not there. It's an incredible experience. I wholeheartedly recommend if you like quality games, you want an experience, play Hellblade. It's a slow start, but once it ramps up, it soon becomes you are then starting to push through your own fears, and it's incredible. The payoff is incredible. Well, in that case, I'll move on to mine. Take a guess. Out of those, out out of the three, is it Final Fantasy fourteen? It's not. Oh. Um, 
The, notice how I didn't even put that on one of my games I of the do. year. I um, do. Okay. Uh, um, I'm going to say Dark Souls for you then. You'd actually be wrong. Is it Subnautica? Nope. My favourite game of the decade is Fire Emblem Awakening. Okay. And the reason is uh, pretty much everything I've already said, but the storyline is one of the most engaging stories I've ever played. Um, it's only 24 chapters long uh, in terms of actual story that you play. Okay. But then there's a lot of cutscenes in between and things. Um, and it just, with those, the paralogues, or little side stories involving your different characters and their children, all of the conversations, you, uh, the support conversations you can have from um, C, B, A, and then S if you get them, if you have them married. Um, as well as all of the DLCs they've introduced, which is other little side stories and things. All of those mixed in together just creates an incredible, immersive experience. And one of the things that does it, that helps build that up, is its music. Um, I said it before, but Don't Speak Her Name and uh, Id Purpose are two of the best soundtracks of any game I've ever played. They set the tone perfectly for what you're about to do and for what's just happened. Don't Speak Her Name makes me cry every time it is played with that chapter. And that's why I picked it. This game invokes so much emotion in me. And as does Dark Souls 3, actually, and Pokemon Omega Ruby, which is why they're my top three. They all made me cry some capacity. Dark Souls 3 was right at the end when you fight the soul of Cinder uh, in his second phase because it's Lord Gwyn everything the way the music hits you the way his animation hits you and the way he prepares to fight you at that last stage set me off omega ruby with uh its final post-game storyline set me off fire and awakening set me off multiple times on my first playthrough just because of everything it does and if you haven't played it get a 3ds get fire emblem awakening with its dlc and play through it at least I would wholeheartedly re recommend it every single time. And when you get to chapter 11, make sure you've got the sound on and then come back to me. You'll understand what I mean. That, that's a glowing review. Okay. Well, I might have to pick that game up then, actually. Please do. Can you still get, you still get the uh, DLC on at the moment? Or did that store close down for the 3DS? No, as far as I'm aware, the, um, the, they're still supporting the 3DS and the 2DS. Okay. Um, you can still buy Fire Emblem Awakening with all this DLC on. Okay, I might have to do that. Okay, <laughs> cool. Right, I think that rounds everything off quite nicely, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. That's mm. it for the, this first one. This is the January one. Uh, we will come back with another one in February. We're going to keep these monthly if we can. Um, yes. Unless we get significantly more to talk about and I keep the time to edit them. So... <laughs> uh, next time, I think next time we should talk about the new frontiers of gaming. Essentially, I'm all about that. So that's one thing we'll talk about, and we'll see what else catches our interest because we haven't even begun mm. talking about anime or anything like that. No, none of it. And like that was kind of one of our big talking points was we should introduce everything we do. We've just gaming is so big in itself. That's what we. I think it's good that we kept gaming to one episode. Like we'll bring anime in for the next mm. one um as well so like we'll touch on sort of like the new frontiers of gaming to sort of bring people in and then we're going to move over to anime to everyone this this is our pilot let us know how we did yeah let us know what you think we did wrong or could improve on like we 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 want to hear positive we want to hear constructive feedback yeah and if you guys want us to talk about something with hashtag nerdventures pc Find my Twitch channel, www.twitch.tv forward slash Falco underscore 77. There'll be a Discord channel that you can drop your ideas into as well that um, we'll make specifically for the podcast. And yeah, just engage with us. We want to talk to you just as much as we're talking to you now. As much Absolutely. as you want to listen to us talk at you. Uh, Which is probably zero, actually. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> you've got the better voice than I do right now. We'll be back in February with another episode of the uh, podcast. So that was. So yes. I've been Hayden. I've been Jordan. And this was No Adventures. We'll see you guys next time. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye.